is that the reptilians always want to fuck us. Or no, the reptilians want to eat us. The other ones want to fuck us. There's a lot of aliens that want to fuck us. Who wouldn't, honestly? I mean, look at us. Especially yeah. us. Yeah, I mean, us in particular, we look like a pair of, of uh, out-of-work garden gnomes. So <laughs> That's somebody's fetish. Don't think <laughs> shame them. Especially aliens. We should be open about any kind of sexuality. You know what? I like to think that our audience is mostly aliens, and that's why it doesn't show up in our statistics. It's well, because yeah. they're listening they're pirating off the from planet. Outer space. Yeah. yeah. So obviously we're not going to get that, but we know we're probably the most popular podcasters on this planet. Yeah. Um, is really the thing, and mm-hmm. nobody knows, if except any- for the reptilians and the draconids. No, the well, I I thought the reptilians were from Alpha Draconis. Um, oh, I well maybe they're the same thing. Yeah, but you've got so. the greys. <laughs> And then you've got the Nords. What are the other ones? Or are those just white supremacists? <laughs> Skyrim is for the Nords. <laughs> Nords only. Uh, but anyway. No, you should. I'm sorry if I just offended a large portion of our listeners. Uh, uh, for all of uh, all the aliens, I'm sorry. You'll, yeah. We'll get around to it. But we're open to any kind of uh, weird humanoid things listening to it, whether they're aliens or reptilians or bizarre kangaroo men. Like they are in the movie today we're watching on the Spectator Film Podcast. Hello, everyone. I'm Max. And I'm Austin. And yes, today we're going to be watching the film Tank Girl. Yes. Ooh. I'm very, I'm very glad. And I, and, and I'm, you know, I, I feel encouraged and happy about imagining the idea of some cryptid kangaroo men listening to our podcast. Even if it is underground and they're weird. Strangely well decorated underground, layer. especially if one of them is actually a dog, and also also if one of them does a very half hearted rap number at the end of this <laughs> podcast for us, that that would be great. Um, yeah, but yeah, we're doing Tank Girl today. This was my pick, but it's a bit. Why do you a, sound unsure about that? Be, because you were more excited to do it than I was in the end, which is kind of interesting. I um, mean, not not necessarily at first. I I was curious. Um, and I'll get into my experience with it, but definitely I think, at, you know, where the cards are right now, I think I might be like a little like zealous about this movie at today, right? At this point in time, I'm feeling a little bit zealous of this movie, not that it needs to be protected or anything, but I just, I, I feel kind of like I'm occupying a little bit of a missionary status to, uh, praise this movie and let everyone know the good news about it. Um, and I have you to thank for that, really. Yeah, so um, if you remember, if you're returning to us, uh, during our Hellboy episode, I brought up that we were originally going to do a double feature that week, and I was just thinking of comic book movies, one that I thought did a very good, faithful adaptation of the comic, and then I was trying to think of one that I'm just like, what's a pretty like universally panned comic book movie that I've seen that like even the creator's not a fan of? And then I was like, oh, Tank Girl, of course. Oh, I thought Hellboy was the panned one. Uh Um, That was a bad delivery of that joke. But Tank Girl, this movie got fucking savaged by critics. It is almost universally considered to just be a gigantic pile of trash. And for a while, I was in that camp. Um, I only saw this movie when I was like 17, I want to say. It's been quite a while. Uh... And I saw it, and I probably shouldn't have done this, but I was 17 and whatever. I was a fan of Jamie Hewlett, who, for our listeners who don't know, Jamie Hewlett is one of the two people behind Tank Girl, the comic book series, and also one, the uh, illustrator for the band The Gorillas. Right. Um, That's probably where most people would be familiar yes, with him modern at this day, point. Mo- yeah, most people would know him from the gorillas at this point. So yes, 2D Noodle, Murdoch, and Russell, all of them are his creations. Um, but So I was a huge fan of the gorillas already. I had just discovered Tank Girl and started like but, voraciously reading all the comics but there. the gorillas was your entry point? Like yes. you learned about Jamie Hewlett Through and the gorillas, you looked up yeah. other things he had done yes, and the, Tank Girl. The gorillas, well, yeah. The, uh, if we have younger listeners... Some of you might be too young to remember, like, when Feel Good Inc. came out, like, just, like, the cultural impact that had that music video was everywhere. That was just... Yeah, I uh, I, yeah. I remember seeing that music video when I was, like, oh, God, how old was I? Like, yeah. I was probably, like, four or five. 
It was just everywhere. It was and, like on uh, every screen, yeah. like every electronic store was just like constantly playing the music video for Feel Good Inc. It was just this hot new thing. It wasn't even their first album, but like that was their that was a big song. Yeah. yeah. Um, I still love the gorillas. They make mostly very solid music to this day. Uh, but yeah, so that was my entry point into Jamie Hewlett's art style, which I still adore. But as I was looking stuff up about him and voraciously just reading every tank girl comic I could get my hands on, mm-hmm. I discovered there was a movie and I got really excited first, but then before I even watched the movie, I found interviews with him where he was just talking about how much he fucking hated working on that movie and what a and, miserable and, experience and it was. And they just, thus they started to poison the well. Yeah, so that tainted my view going in. And I remember watching this movie and basically being like, oh, this movie is a mess. It doesn't even have like, it's not structured like a regular film should be. It's it. everything wrong with this movie was the studio's fault. And because of it, it's a pile of trash. It's the cr- ass backwards. Yes, the creator has disavowed it, so I'm going to side with the creator and just be like, there's no good points of this movie. And I basically am just like, okay, I, I've seen the Tank Girl movie. I can go back to just reading the comics or right. moving on with my life. But just to clarify, you did, obviously you read a lot of it, but for anybody who hasn't listened to any of the other episodes or doesn't know this about Max, the Tank Girl comic book seemed to me, as somebody who hasn't read it but has only seen the movie, as something that is 100% in your, uh, I guess, aesthetic or something that would appeal to you, especially in high school. Right? Yeah. Am I correct? Uh, so I bet you also had a bit of a personal investment in being excited for the movie as well when you learned yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, in the movie, I would say one of the strong points of the movie, because we're going to... I'll, I'll play my hand here. Austin already said he's here to praise the movie. Praise it. I'm kind of here on the same page at this point. Yeah. Like, after rewatching this and viewing it through a different lens, I kind of really like this movie. Um, it does stay true to the comics in one aspect of there's not really like a through line story throughout like every single tank girl comic. There's no like overarching arcs and whatnot. Mm-hmm. It's all just sort of like you can pick up an issue and figure out what the fuck is going on. And it's crazy and anarchic and all over the place. And the laws of physics are yeah, whatever. Um, and the movie kind of does a good job of doing that <laughs> in the movie form. Right. Which is very hard to do. But I, I don't think this movie is without flaws, obviously. And there's a lot of things that you can tell. You're just like, ooh, ah, okay. So that's either the producers coming in and just be like, no, you can't do that. Or just like they ran out of budget. So they had to do this here. Jimmy Hewlett famously said that he hated working on this. Cause like they forgot to film a lot of scenes that they then forced them to animate afterwards. Mm-hmm. So that was a lot of extra work on his part. Um, a lot of the animated segments look great, but just as like a punk aesthetic, fun, wild ride. I think this movie's, a really good time. Also, it's like really cool female characters without like following into the modern studio, strong female character trope. Right. Yeah, trope. And I'm going to say that that was a little bit before yeah. that marketing point. I, it would be interesting to like look through cinema history and try to find the first time that that specifically like 21st century idea of strong female character, the like Disneyland idea of it yeah um first really it popped up in marketing because i'm sure they marketed because definitely i would say that's not hmm, i don't know maybe you that could be part of it i mean i love mulan you'd have to go back and look at it really i'll sing be a man with you all like all the way through but definitely like that idea of what you were talking about is different from like a 70s you know, exploitation movie thing where it's like, she won't take any guff. And it's like a cut of her, like yeah. it's a shot in the trailer of her murdering a bunch of men. It's a little bit different, that, that mm-hmm. idea. Um, but definitely this movie is not preoccupied with the uh, appearance of being about a strong female character. It is too irreverent to give a fuck about appearing as anything for anyone. And that is part of the reason. I really like it. I mean, in the comics, Tank Girl describes her aesthetic herself as, am I a hedonist or am I a feminist? <laughs> so, like, it's kind of... the A devil-may-care ab- attitude the character has toward what you view her as is very integral to the character, and I think this movie as a whole kind of captures that very well. Yeah. I should say, though, like, if you're looking for things that, like, most people look for in a traditional movie, 
um, like a narrative structure, a like through line throughout the entire course of a movie moving from objective a to objective B in a timely manner. This movie has none of those things. Right. Like, it, well, th- okay. Then let me segue into my experience with it. Yes. Then we, then we can really launch into a quick conversation that before we begin our commentary track. So, uh, I won't say that I was oblivious of this movie before you mentioned it, but I had only just heard it. And in my mind, hearing the, the name tank girl and also that sort of accompanied by the dismissive tone in which I would hear it occasionally, not even occasionally, rarely mentioned uh, on different podcasts or in articles or something just throughout the internet talking about movies. Uh, I was aware of this movie only in the most vague way as something that people didn't really care to even mm-hmm. think about. Yeah, well, because you brought up that, like, this is very up my alley, sort of just like punk, yeah. Yeah, punk rock counterculture type thing i should bring up this is like the opposite of your aesthetic <laughs> almost to i wouldn't agree. necessarily say so i would just say that i won't but i I'm just don't necessarily like, feel attracted to something based on an aesthetic yeah you know which is i i usually do that's like yeah. a primary selling point for me but yeah i mean i was abducted by aliens and they changed something in my brain i just don't get excited i talk like a robot and uh i eat human flesh and uh, I think that's you know, where my arm went. God damn it. <laughs> He's holding the microphone with one arm right now. It's actually really impressive. Um, so uh, anyway, point being, this was not necessarily something that would appeal to me automatically either. Right. That's true. Um, but definitely it wasn't something that I sought out and wasn't something I was really familiar with at all. That said, when you mentioned it as an adaptation of a comic book, it immediately clicked in my brain. That made sense. I fit it into a category of 90s comic book movies, which to me are more interesting than 2000s and Because they're less formulaic because they had no idea what the fuck they were doing back then. They, they're also rough around the edges. They're like teenage yeah. year comic books. It's like awkward years. Sometimes well, yeah, their teeth are a little bit too long for their they're mouth. Like, this, they're like, yeah. Compared to like the Marvel extravaganza that we have now, they're like student films because like they don't really know what they're doing. They're not sure what beats to hit. Whereas now you go see a Marvel movie, they're going to do this, 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 yes. and this. Like, And if I had to compare this to a, a superhero movie today, I would say a good comparison is Deadpool, even though I'm comparing it to a movie I haven't seen because I haven't seen either of those. But does that make sense to you? If we compare this to Deadpool, I don't know if you've seen it. I No, I've seen yeah, both Deadpool movies. I didn't yeah. I didn't like the second I mean, one as much. But like, Tank Girl does not address the camera straightforwardly, no, but, but it's the same type of irreverence. And... Uh, you know, when I, when I watched this movie for the first time, I think the text I sent you when I was part way through it is that this is better than Hellboy so far. And uh, I don't remember your reaction. And while I feel like that is more, I, I didn't debate, believe you at first. I thought like because you like messing with me a lot. So I was like, I thought it might be a trap of just like you trying to get me to be like, oh yeah, I'm glad you really like this. And you're just like, no, actually this is fucking stupid. So I think my response is very measured of just like, really? Are, are, are you sure? But no, you continued to love it after that. No, I mean, I think it's not so cut and dry about which is necessarily better, but definitely Tank Girl strikes me as a movie that's more, well, I hate the phrase more unique. And yet I always into the fall into the trap of like, saying it it's like you got to structure that sentence better uh, but i said yesterday but, there's no movie quite like this it is a rarity you know especially for its time and place and the type of movie that it is um like it's just this there really is not a lot like this movie and that's not even its prime virtue i think you're talking about you know it being you know disorganized messy uh, lacking linearity and a strong sense of continuity or lacking a clear sense of stakes or truly well-explored characters with clear character arcs. I can understand why this movie flopped and I can understand why people still dismiss it. But after watching it, I looked online because I'm like, clearly somebody had to have revised their opinion of this movie at some point, And this must be a cult movie online because after watching it, and we're going to talk about this a little bit before we start the movie, I, I felt like this was a prime candidate for that like hashtag feminist idea where people re-examine this movie and they pick it back up. But you know what I think the thing the is comics have been actually a lot of people have been revisiting the original comics yeah. and just being like, Oh, there were okay. Yeah. Yeah. And th- again, me saying that, not necessarily saying I agree 
with that way of evaluating things yeah. or that we would necessarily even find this movie feminist, as we will discuss. But I do think that it would have that sort of appeal now in 2019. And I looked online and it wasn't really there. There's some cult activity with this movie. It is not a big cult movie. And I think the thing is, it's sort of like what you were saying where it's it's not even necessarily that this movie was so much panned. It was. But it's just, it was so quickly dismissed. It's like, and it, I, they didn't even put the energy into really panning it. You know what I mean? It's like Ishtar, right? Ishtar gets a lot of blame for being a terrible movie, even though it's really not that bad. Oh, Ishtar. It just, it just lost a lot of money. But that's like famous, you know? Ishtar is, is Ishtar a famous is no Battlefield financial. Earth. Yes. Like, Battlefield Earth, too, is like well known as a fucking flop. But, but you know what? I would I'll watch Battlefield Earth again. I found it fucking hilarious. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> that's offensive to our alien listeners. They are just like, do not associate us with John Travolta for the love of God. Crack uh, Leslie's ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> we don't talk like that. <laughs> um, but anyway, but anyway, point is that the, that is well known. And this movie isn't even well known as being a flop. It's just thoroughly dismissed. And that is just, that is such a fucking shame. Because I think if literally anybody involved in this had somewhat of a passion for it, then maybe like if Jamie Hewlett was just like, listen, it didn't turn out the way we liked it, but like, it's still like really cool seeing my creation on the screen. Based if on the director was like, Oh, I still really like this. Even if we didn't meet all of our goals, if, or even if like, if there was somebody in the production of this movie who was still just like, yeah, I know it was kind of bad, but there are, yeah. there are, you can find a few interviews, some of which I'll be able to link in the show notes where people talk about, you know, the thing after fact and retrospect, and they talk about it being a clusterfuck, but they do have a feeling that the film has found a type of audience. I'm just saying that audience is so limited yeah. compared to other movies like this that could, should have an audience. And by the way, I haven't really truly ex talked about my opinion of this movie and how good it is. I think the messiness of this movie, it's reverence and it's sort of disorganization and it's shunning of linearity, both in terms of realism and plot, is 100% part of the core of what this movie's about. And yes, a lot of the comic interludes and a lot of the crazy inexplicable shit that happened, you can say is directly a result of interference or them not having money to film certain things or just running out of time or not even knowing what to shoot, right? You could say that's the result of it being a clusterfuck, but you know what? it doesn't even fucking matter because the movie as it ex is existing right now and how it is organized, whether the filmmakers truly intended this or not works 100%. And if you think this movie is bad because it is disorganized or because it is irreverent and doesn't hold dear this idea of realism or stakes or continuity, I think you're wrong. I was trying to think of, cause I was saying before there's no quite comparable movie to this in my thing um but i was thinking the other night this kind of hold, bear with me it kind of reminds me of a john waters movie to a degree where okay. in a john waters movie there's a lot of bad acting for a lot uh, in a lot of the side roles there's like the movies themselves look like really dirty and filled right. and whatnot and very cheaply produced but because like that's in, like tied into our the main characters in a lot of the movies and the entire premise of the movie itself all of those things that would be seen as mistakes or flaws in other movies just serve to elevate it. To they turn this. into the actual virtue of the movie. Yes. It's because it incorporates those things that might be considered mistakes or flaws into actually part of its aesthetic and it becomes part of its subversion. Yeah. And that's what this movie does. And, you know, maybe people who have listened to the show before might think I'm like sounding a little bit intense about this movie. And the reason being is because when I watched it, I felt weirdly melancholy because it just ma it makes me feel like I've been lied to because this movie was dismissed. And based on just a cursory Google search of some of the stuff talking about this movie, I feel like it was dismissed for sexist reasons. Right. And whenever you see a movie that is dismissed or like forgotten or just not, it doesn't even have an audience now. And it is done because of a reason that is based on the, the people involved or the subject matter 
being too far outside of what is supposed to be like a, an idea of acceptance, right? Even in terms of quality and, and or like plot and how that's structured. I think it makes me feel like I've been robbed of an experience that I should have been having. And it makes me think about how many other movies that are potentially like this that we just have no clue exist and we'll never know exist throughout our entire lives. Like you and I, there will be movies that we never get an opportunity to watch in our, at any point in our entire lives. That the majority are, of movies, actually. Well, I'm saying specific ones that are, whether they're made by women, uh, people of color, or like people of a different sexuality, whatever reason, they were marginalized to the corners when they were released, they were forgotten, and because they were so dismissed, more so than being like panned and slammed by critics or whatever, we won't even know they exist. We will never know they exist, and we will live our entire lives without ever getting an opportunity to see them, or even a choice. The yeah. choice is being removed from us by the response to these movies, and it makes me upset because <laughs> this movie is good. And uh, if you reject this movie on the reasons that I anticipate most people would, I think you just have to watch the movie for real. Because like you said, uh, I, I think it's easy to watch this movie as a fan of Jamie Hewlett or the comic books, even though I'm not yeah. even aware or had much experience with those things. But I think it's easy to have those glasses on when you're watching this movie. And then I understand why people might have that knee jerk reaction to it because it is so irreverent. It has no concern for like formal logic or plot logic or realism logic. But I think that's all the knee jerk reaction. And if you actually give yourself self a chance to watch the movie, you will realize from very quickly that the movie is deliberately steering into that. And that's part of what the movie is trying to do aesthetically. I don't even know if it's deliberate. I think that's an important thing, but I think the end result is so in like, is so anarchic in its final, final form, whether or not that was their goal all mm -hmm. along or not. But I think the very anarchic sort of chaotic nature of it just sort of goes back around to creating this, aesthetic fueled romp through the post apocalypse. But like, yeah, I'm not as strong. Like if you don't like this movie, I get you, but I'm happy we revisited it yeah. for this podcast well, because I think it's, I think I'm going to continue to enjoy yeah, this movie well, for let's, a long time. Let, let me clarify. I'm not saying about whether or not you like it. You can yeah. like or not like movies, but I would challenge anybody who says this movie is bad for those reasons that I expect most people would. If somebody came up with a reason that I didn't anticipate, that's one thing, right? But for the most reasons that are offered, if you said that and you said this movie was bad, I would challenge you because I think that's just wrong and you're not actually paying attention to the movie. And also, um, oh God, I've just completely forgot what, what I was going to say. But before we jump into the commentary, um, I, I really wanted to have this conversation sort of at the beginning because I felt like it might be exhausting <laughs> if we were talking about whether or not this film is feminist or not <laughs> throughout the entire commentary. Oh, okay. Well, okay, it doesn't have to be a burden to talk about. No, it doesn't. It's just we're like <laughs> n neither of us are women. Um, right. Well, that's the thing to begin with. Yes. When we have this conversation, this is not us you, like trying to... Um, become arbiters of what is or is not feminism, but we're trying to use the tools available to us to extend, defer to other authorities. Well, and use the guidelines they've presented in a way that we might be able to understand it. Well, not just that it's that we're going to use whatever tools we have to try to extend a conversation. As far as I'm concerned, all our episodes, it's an open book. We never, Whenever we talk about a movie, oh, no, we're not, never saying yeah. like this movie is good. Where our opinion is the final one. Yes. So listen to us now. But even with we we are open to the idea of doing movies multiple times because we consider our episodes to be something that could be in dialogue with one another. Yeah. Right. And our own opinions are dial in dialogue with our opinions on the same movie in the future. Right. There, the book never closes, and that goes the same thing here. We're just trying to more accurately get an idea of what this movie means in terms of whether or not it's feminist. And for that, I think we're going to use the same article we've used for our conversation on Legally Blonde, which I thought was really insightful. Um, I believe the title is Let's Stop Calling Movies Feminist. It's a blog post by Anna Biller, who is a director. She directed The Love Witch in a movie Fantastic called... Fantastic film, by the way. Go I've, watch seen, the Love Witch. I've not seen The Love Witch. 
Um, but she also directed a movie called Viva, which I hear is pretty good. And they are both on the Criterion channel right now, folks. So maybe that's getting Criterion released. That'd be pretty cool. But at I any would rate, buy the, a Criterion release of The Love Witch. Maybe it would even have subtitles. Maybe. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> but um, at any rate, this blog post I think is really insightful because what she, I'm going to just. I won't go through it very thoroughly here, but I'm going to link to it in the show notes. A lot of what she's talking about is a recent trend, like we were talking about, for marketing companies and then critics and then audiences to refer to certain movies as being feminist movies when uh, in this article, Biller provides reasons that that is convoluting the definition of what feminism could be or should be and making it something that is, is not like effective at actually having a, a feminist conversation. It's taking the term and sort of nullifying it in a, in a specific way that she goes into. But essentially what she talks about is this difference between movies that have characters that are female characters that are empowered and a movie that tries to empower its female characters and movies that love their female characters. And that is not necessarily the same as a movie that's feminist. And again, she goes into it at greater length in her article but primarily part of her definition for a feminist movie is something that it, it will agitate for feminism politically and explicitly in the film, right? Yeah, like a, a movie that is put up, a fairly recent movie that we both love, that has brought up a lot recently as a great empowering movie for uh, women, Mad Max Fury Road. Yeah. Wonderful. I, I'm going to start a checkboard of every time I say the word wonderful and just take a shot every time I do it and die by the end of a podcast. Good. But anyway, an amazing film. Yes. Nobody, I will fight you if you don't think Mad Max Free Road is an amazing film with great female leads, great female performances, strong focus on females liberating themselves. By her standards, not a feminist film, I yes. would say. And I think I would agree with that. And uh, the other important thing, to talk about her article is that she's not making a value judgment. She's not necessarily saying that one is better than the other, but I think she's calling for something that I think both of us find very useful as an idea, which is like, let's be discerning because when she, what she's talking about is the idea of like, when the idea, like the term, the concept of a feminist film becomes just a blanket term for anything that has like a female lead that like, does things or whatever, or anything that is passing that is merely not misogynist, right? Then it runs it, the well. It, yeah, it convolutes the term and it makes it harder to have an actual conversation about feminist movies that are focusing on it. And I know? get that. Well, there's also, I wanted to bring this up yeah. as well. Um, there's a term that I see, or a tool rather, that I see used a lot in modern uh, spaces, especially the internet. Uh, to judge whether or not a movie has healthy female representation. Um, a lot of you might be familiar with it. It's called the Bechdel test. It's yes. three very simple questions um, that if a, a graph I found proves to be accurate, only about roughly half of Hollywood movies actually pass, which is kind of sad. But are there at least two female characters in the movie? Do they talk to each other? And do they have a conversation that is not about a man? Right. Um, Tank Girl is very interesting in this regard. Yeah. Because I think it aces the Bechdel test. Well, not just in fulfilling all three of those, but there are numerous female characters in this. They all talk to each other. And I don't think a single conversation they have with each other is about a man. And furthermore, I think it, it would, I guess it would be debatable about what you define as like scenes, but like, there are inserts without female characters, but they're like insert moments. They're transition scenes. In terms of extended scenes, I don't think there are any extended scenes that don't have female characters. Yeah. And it's just the, the main scenes of those are just Malcolm McDowell doing something else that's evil. Or he's drinking water again. Oh, or, God. Or watching the female characters right. do something So else. when you say it aces the Bechdel test, it's, it's, it, I feel like it's... If, I feel like you can't even say that because it's like it's not even what is the other test you would apply? It's not even in the same ballpark as that, you know? Yeah. It's not even fucking concerned with the Bechdel test. It's okay. so focused on just trying to tell the story of its female characters that it doesn't even fucking bother with that. Well, yeah, and I want to say that, like, 
a lot on the internet, I see like, oh, well, this movie passes the Bechdel test. It that kind of makes that it made, it's a good feminist film. Yes. Which one, if we're going by the definition we just brought <laughs> forward by Anna Biller, not true. Um, I personally, this is just my opinion. Yeah. I think a movie passing the Bechdel test is the bare minimum for female representation in a film. Right. That's just me though. Well, um, it's it's sort of like every again everything. It's a model. It's not necessarily going to be a perfect description of every movie some movies won't pass the Bechdel test but they'll focus a lot on their female characters but the thing is like when you when you like make the discussion of a movie so shallow that it's basically a yes or no question and that determines whether or not it's like feminist I think that is not necessarily the place you want to be and I think that's something that's easy for people who do marketing for movies to turn the idea of a feminist film into something that they can capitalize on if they can turn it into a yes or no thing right and then suddenly they're making money off it and now our 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 ability to have a conversation about a feminist movie that's genuinely focused on exploring that is going to become impaired over time and I also like you're saying I think that's that's a part of what Anna Biller is saying. And I don't think she's against the Bechdel test or anything. No, I think it's a helpful tool yeah. for like, cause the, the, there was a theory, I think it's called the Smurfette theory where <laughs> what? Yeah, okay. So bear with me here. <laughs> okay. Where men think that if there's one woman, a yeah, woman in a show, like in their head, there's enough female representation. <laughs> so like a weird specific type of like tokenism. Yeah. That's like, but oh. just one woman. <laughs> yeah. So oh, that's interesting. I don't know why they chose the Smurfs because literally it's just like, Oh, you have all these Smurfs and they all have personality. And then there's a Smurf who her, the her personality is girl. <laughs> Would power Rangers be that too? No, I don't know. Power well, Rangers. No, there's two. Um, oh, okay. But it doesn't pass the blatant racism test of having the red Ranger be native American and the yellow Ranger be an Asian American. But anyway, that's a different conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but anyway, and hopefully we'll both die before we get an opportunity to do a Power Rangers movie. Yeah, I loved that when I was like <laughs> three years old and I have no idea why. But anyway, we're going to link to a lot of these things. You guys can make yeah. a decision. But uh, There's I, not I, a lot of podcasts that talk about this, though. Um, or at least specifically not in terms of Tank Girl. I don't think a lot of people talk about Tank Girl. But I yeah. think... No, that's what I was saying. Oh, uh, yeah. Like in terms of applying Anna Biller's article and the lessons from that article to tank girl. Um, I'm not sure exactly how we fall on this at this moment. When we watched it yesterday, we weren't quite sure. And I think where I am, I'm at right now, I think that tank girl is not necessarily a feminist movie by Anna Biller standards because it does not agitate politically and explicitly. But I will say that it is, I feel like it's close and I think you could mount an argument because there's no denying that this movie has very strong subtext and the subtext guides the direction of the movie and the subtext is all about exploring their experience in ways that become almost blatantly political. We're going to, spoilers, Naomi Watts shoots a man in the head ruthlessly at the end and it is a triumphant moment. Uh, Tank Girl would rather let the the Sam would rather let the little girl die than than concede anything to Malcolm McDowell. Those are moments that have near political edge to them for me because they're so like strong like in your face about it. Um, also the character of Tank Girl, as we see her in the movies and comic, would probably spit in your face if you tried to sit her down and ask her <laughs> if this movie politically qualifies as a feminist film. Right. So, so I, I think this movie relies a lot on a type of feminist aesthetic, which we're going to talk about in the commentary. It subverts a lot of tropes in a way that is very interesting and seems deliberately feminist. Definitely. It is a movie that kind of sets up a battle of the sexes, right? Uh, everything about the bad guys is coded for being masculine and oppressive and dominant and tank girl is shown as being as more sort of fluid, um, feminine energy. Right. Um, and I think that's very clear in the subtext, but because it's not political, I think I can't quite say it, but I think you could definitely have a conversation about it because it is still doing that. And I guess to compare it to legally blonde, the last movie we applied this article to, which I think is, feminist because I think it's very explicit in that movie. I like, think we came to the conclusion that it just barely crossed the finish line for well, us, but I think we decided that it had feminist goals. Yeah. It's just, it doesn't 
succeed quite as much. Whereas to compare it to this, I think this movie is better than Legally Blonde. And I think uh, this movie, even though I wouldn't say it's necessarily feminist, I would say it doesn't necessarily set up those goals. And I think it is actually way more successful at empowering its characters than Legally Blonde is. Even though Legally Blonde, I think, is more explicitly about her finding the equality in a world that is dominated by men, right? Whereas this one's more just about resistance. I think this movie is far more successful at actually achieving a type of empowerment. And uh, I don't know, it's just an interesting conversation. And I feel like it's a conversation people should be having about this movie and that it's time that this movie gets re-examined because it's been uh, under the rug for far too yeah. long. There's a lot of podcasts and not a lot of them talk about this. I mean, everybody has a podcast. Yeah. Birds do it. Bees do it. Even educated fleas do it. Austin. Oh, let's let's go. Ah, uh, oh, you, were, were you going to say something? Yeah, here we are. Did you know uh, MGM bought? Yeah, when the CEO at the time came into control of the company, he bought the rights to Tank Girl for like twenty five grand. I think was the grand sum. Cool. Oh God, <laughs> that's worth more than we'll ever be worth. No doubt. Don't come on, Austin. Oh, you don't want me to jinx that? Okay. All right. What about our sponsorship? <laughs> loot, you, loot box. Oh no, God! Don't. Oh God, I can't even think about that right Get now. Get all of your favorite comic book things in one you know convenient $80 a month box. Let's save that for later in the movie because I cannot start by talking about something that stupid. <laughs> At any rate, I was going to mention that for everyone who was curious when we were talking about it beforehand in the introduction, uh, it was MGM that fucked up this movie. Yes. Thank you. At any rate, I still think it's good. By the way, before uh, we get too far past this opening sequence, I'm going to mention the one interesting academic article I found on this movie. Um, it was hard to dig up a lot of them, but I did find one. It's called Post-Human Romance Parody and Pastiche in Making Mr. Right, which is another movie, and Tank Girl. And it's written by Marilyn Manners and R.L. Rutsky. And uh, I don't even know if I'm going to be quoting it directly, but I'm going to be putting it a little bit in the show notes because reading it really helped articulate some feelings I was having about this movie after watching it. And I think they put do a really good job of sort of elaborating on why this movie actually works. And uh, yeah, I might maybe draw a few quotes from it later on. But uh, Max, here's my question for you. How long did you read the comics before you watched this movie? Did you put it out? Because I know you or put it off a while because I know you mentioned you were a fan of the comic books, but I don't know exactly how much in terms of like a timeline sense, the movie's reputation dissuaded you not, from actually not that long watching. actually. Um, because I was also in the phase of just sort of Stan trying, Winston, by the way. Yes. Trying to, and to be fair, like the costume design and this looks great. Yeah. It looks better than ghoulies. Um, <laughs> I, I guess if you want to compare it to ghoulies, <laughs> But uh, he, so uh, it was probably like six months, honestly. It probably wasn't that long. It was, okay. It was like, as I discovered them, like after I read a bunch of Jamie Hewlett's original Tank Girl comics, I was just like, okay, let's watch the movie. And then I, as I was getting like already, like I was, as I was getting ready to watch the movie, I stumbled upon Jamie Hewlett's opinion of it. So it wasn't like a long period of time. It wasn't just like, Oh, I'm going to avoid seeing this because I'm a true fan of the comics. Yeah. But like I still went into it with that lens and that contaminated my view. Well, we've arrived at the opening shot. And I think uh, one thing I mentioned is that I think this movie wins you over and starts pointing the direction that it's going in immediately. And part of it has to do with this weird thing where I think the post-apocalyptic setting in this movie is so specifically generic. And this movie plays so much with the idea of pastiche and parody like it says in the article, uh, generally that the fact that the, the, uh, like she has a severed hand with a middle finger. I didn't even see that. Do you see that? <laughs> yeah. Um, this post-apocalyptic, which she's using to mush the bull. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that to hit you whenever you say something that annoys me from now on. Thanks tank girl. You inspire me. Um, but this setting in the opening sequence is so generic, right? that it's almost like transparent 
And one thing we talked about in the preparation screening is how this opening sort of uh, monologue that she gives that provides the exposition feels like somehow, it, somehow it feels like eating vegetables when you're a kid. It's like you're getting it out of the way, just got to do it, right? Yeah. It's just setting up the barest amount of information. But the way it's so done, almost like dashed off here, and specifically the contrast to Tank Girl in this moment when she stands up and now we get like the power guitar, yeah. right? But that's also combined with her voice, her performance decisions. I think uh, Lori Petty is very good in this she, movie. Yeah, I believe she, when she like, was introduced to like the comics, like in preparation for this movie, she started laughing and just went, okay, I'm tank girl. This yeah. is perfect. So. I mean, I think the way she begins her performance here is she's very committed to this and she's very confident. I think it's a good performance because it doesn't try to prove anything <laughs> and she's just, she's going to do this character. Yeah. And that's exactly the way a character this bold has to be played. Um, but there's also a lot of things in this character that could go wrong and people could find annoying, you know? And uh, the way she commits to it, I think, is really... This is what I'd call a brave performance, and this, despite how fun it seems and how easy you would... Uh, how good it might feel to be on screen as that character, I think it's bold to, to take this role. And um, I think... I, I think the contrast of the way she's delivering the lines with how boring everything is immediately tells you that this movie is all about the character. And furthermore, it's all about her style. You know, I'm not going to just a quick little fun thing. I remember yeah. the first time I saw this movie just because like the wear like thing he's wearing in the back. I thought he was like wearing a G string that you could <laughs> see as soon as his shirt went up just for that brief moment. That wouldn't necessarily be out of place here. No, it wouldn't. Nobody gives a fuck. I mean, we're both wearing that. Yeah, of course. I laughed out of recognition. I thought, well, oh, just like the ones we have. Yeah, that's our uh, check out spectatorfilmblogcast.com in our Merc section for you know, the I was official just gonna, G string I, of the Spectator you Film If Blogcast. you weren't going to plug it, I was. That's the only merchandise we sell. We have sizes for aliens as well. Um, but here, again, immediately, I get the impression that this is not at all about plot, this movie. This, movie, this is all this opening prologue is going to tell us is that this is not about plot, but it's all about style. It's all about performance. And it's all about the irreverence of what's going on. And uh, I think this is going to wind up being a more interesting scene the further we go along in the movie. But as of right now, the movie is setting up a lot of what it's going to be doing by by introducing these sort of, uh, I don't know, the 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 playful like sexuality that is going to yeah. be running throughout the rest of the film. Oh, she has a shirt that says wanker. I didn't even <laughs> see that. We also are going to start selling that. That's fun though. What? I was just getting it. I don't know. Just the, the kids are so fucking used to it. Yeah. But again, it, it I think it does a really good job of selling the irreverence. Yeah. You know? Um, also, it, I want to bring up the boyfriend character. Uh, because he has no overall bearing on the plot and he's not important. No. All. Now you could say it's sort of a limiting reductive cliche to have a woman that's like a female Avenger, you yeah. know, like either someone close to her gets murdered and that's her impetus for revenge. And that is the plot of the movie is the revenge or she gets raped or something. Yeah. And that is the revenge It's like a miss 45 situation. Um, but this movie is like, okay, we set up with that premise but it's interesting because the movie very quickly moves on from that character and she does not bring up her boyfriend ever again. Her resistance to water and power yeah. is an in the moment resistance and it's about her own agency. It's not about getting back at them. You killed my boyfriend. So I'm going yep. to destroy it. No. Oh God, this is just so funny. We have to just interrupt ourselves with how hilarious this is. I also think Malcolm McDowell is giving just a, an amazing performance. I think, yeah. So early on, I really like his performance. I think toward the end of the movie, it kind of peters out a bit, but I think early on, just how fucking comically over the top evil he is. He he is taking all the dumbest tropes of the like oppressive bad guy antagonist and then gendering them, gendering those things as masculine, which is why it's interesting. Yeah. Um, and the self seriousness of it is perfect. He's so great at selling the self seriousness. Just the moment I saw this, I started laughing because I knew the type of scene it was going to be the moment it started, but just the fact that it began with them swishing water in champagne glasses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and his punishment for this guy, uh, he doesn't actually die in this scene, but instead he, he brings him to the shunting later. So it's a little reversal of, of this, 
this man's role in society. If you're confused by that, you should watch Society. And this uh, character is, this actor is the dad yeah. from Society. Uh, yeah, if you haven't seen Society, go into that movie knowing nothing about it. Just go and watch it. It, it will be worth it. But at any rate, I think uh, this scene is wonderfully generic. Yeah. And I think it does a good job of really gendering the tropes that we expect with this type of antagonist as masculine ones, right? They're very well coded. Um, also, it's is it weird? He's, he says feta, but is it supposed to be feta? Who cares? I think feta cheese, but he says feta. That sounds like a government agency. Yeah. Is this, I don't know. Is it a plane where they had cheese previously? Or was it a plane where there like was a government agency? Or is it like an actual place agency? in Australia, maybe? I don't know. Well, this was filmed yeah. in Australia. Mm-hmm. This is a very Australian movie. Yeah, and well, Jamie Hewlett's Australian himself. So like, so is, uh, uh, God. I think. Why or am I might be English. Natalie Woods? What the fuck? Naomi Watts yeah. is Australian. And also that one extra is Australian. You're holding water. Not smart. Oh, yeah. Speaking of extras that are in this movie, do we want to talk about one that we're going to be trying to find the entire film? Oh, no. I, I don't even care about finding Jennifer Lawrence. Oh, yeah. Jennifer Lawrence is in this movie. Uh, We don't know where, but it's been confirmed by her and the director that she is, in fact, an extra in this movie somewhere. So I don't even know. She could have been playing one of these men in the background for all I know. <laughs> like it's entirely possible. She's just one of like the little kids in the background at a uh, deep silver place. But like, I don't even know. So she's somewhere, I guess. Yeah. So, so yeah, if you want to spend hours looking for that, I guess you can. Um, at any rate, this scene is also interesting because I think it does a good job of setting up something we'll see play out through later scenes and interactions with Malcolm McDowell where this movie also plays up the idea of his motivations. And again, Malcolm McDowell's character here, he's, he's a stock villain character in this movie is going to imbue him with, as a representation of masculinity in general and masculine, uh, domination and oppressiveness. Right. And what he's doing here is he's demonstrating that for him, it's not even so much about the material possession of what he's trying to do. Right. He already owns 95% of the water. Yes. In the entire desert. It is all about control. And that's why he becomes a good representation of like the dominant masculine patriarchal ideology, whatever you want to call it. Because ultimately what, what that ideology does, both in this movie and just in real life, is that it is a regulating force. It is something that polices boundaries. It fits things into categories. It, it establishes like us and them oppositions between different people, right? That is what it does. And that is something that this, this conglomerate of water and power constantly tries to do. Also, the other fun thing is, is how it combines that with the outfit of um, him sort of being compared to maybe a priest's collar or something like that. Again, it's, it's very visually coded and, and I think it's done successfully because the movie carries it out. It's not just a shallow thing that happens once. Also speaking of costumes and Malcolm McDowell, we see her yeah. here in a bowler hat There's and so, then on one side of the eye, we have the little both sides of the eyes, but it is noticeable Yeah, right after you see Malcolm McDowell when he's one of the most famous rogues in film history, one of the famous, most famous like adolescent punks. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you could read some sort of, intertextual intertextuality into that. But I think it's interesting that you cut from one to the next and we'll see him again, uh, portrayed in certain ways that seem to call back to a clockwork orange, but here it's very interesting for sure. And again, that's also something we should talk about is smoking that Sherman Fantasia is the entire movie. That's an interesting thing. They stopped making those cigarettes, but after you smoke them all, I, you drove them to extinction. I, I would buy them once a year on my birthday just to feel like a pretty princess. Cause they had the gold filters and the multicolored, uh, cigarette papers they i don't know what that means what the I, the filter is the part of the cigarette you hold and then they would have okay the the actual like cigarette paper part would be just different yeah, colors and then they banned them because they thought they were marketing to children which was dumb because only me and old ladies bought them oh no she's dead already <laughs> i think uh, Lori petty gives a like a very weirdly good like <laughs> physical c- comedy performance 
she's very good at controlling her body in a way that is also evocative of the character. Everything she does is good. Um, and uh, hashtag butt smear. You had that going? <laughs> no. I'm down with that. It is not becoming. And this is the other weird thing. I mean, we're talking about intertextuality. Like, that's not like a direct reference to Phantasm, but it's just weird that they have a Phantasm ball. Yeah. <laughs> it's like kind of funny that they have that. I don't know how that got there, but <laughs> they definitely have a Phantasm ball. Um, well, she got it off the dead soldier. I beginning. guess so. No, you saw her take it out. Oh, okay. Yeah. So at any rate, this movie relies on a lot of intertextuality. We've already seen, you know, maybe a clockwork orange reference, but we've already seen Doris Day, uh, stuff like that. This movie, again, we're going to use the words pastiche. Maybe postmodern is a word you can yeah. use. It you, she, And Tank Girl specifically as well, even more specifically than the movie itself, recycles and uses a lot of cultural objects and ideas to express herself. And it's going to be interesting the way she defines herself using those things. And we'll see it play out the rest of the movie. But this scene is also where I started to really key in on the movie and feel like it was doing something more interesting because she thinks that this is her boyfriend. As yeah. we know, it is his birthday. And uh, she's going to do... Again, it's sort of like continuing the sexual game that they had going on before, right? An extension of their sexual dynamic. Yeah. And uh, she's still in control, though. Yes. And again, she is making herself a spectacle and performing for him. And the camera reacts to this. What we do is that this, what we see is this movie starts embracing the idea of the male gaze in a very explicitly visual way, right? As uh, her boyfriend is watching her. Right, even though she's in control of the situation, the camera becomes a male, a, a part of the male gaze, and we become implicated in that. And then it is revealed that it's the soldier. So it becomes this weird violation of trust. And what do we see when we look at him? He's got the weird fucking goggle eyes, right? If ever you wanted to try to code for or portray visually in a very clear way the idea of like the male gaze at work in a specific scene, that's a pretty good way to do it in terms of somebody's outfit, right? Yeah. He's got those huge goggles on. And then as we've discussed, this this just this entire sequence is like is shot and feels exactly like the idea of like a police raid or a, yeah. or a drug war thing. Um kind of Reminds me of uh, Dawn of the Dead with Ken Forey and the rest of those cops. Um, and then we're going to see that he's going to continue to try to take advantage of her. And this is the first time in the movie where Tinker will use her sexuality uh, to to trick the male gaze and kind of the camera as well. And she does so by blowing sand in his eyes, his gazing eyes, kicking him in the balls, and then pulling the pins on his two grenades in quotes, yeah. that make him explode. You could say that that's maybe reaching, but I think it's fairly no, it's, on the it's, surface. It's kind of presented so obviously yes. you can't not read it that way. But it's not stupid because this movie has such a sense of irreverence that the blatant nature of it just makes it amusing. The movie does not take itself so seriously as that, but she still does it, you know? So I think it works. It works really well tonally. And then she just goes back here, and, and tries to save her family. But we're going to see that time and again throughout this movie where Rachel Talele, the director, will, in certain scenes, really take advantage of the cliched aesthetics of the male gaze when a woman is presenting herself as a sexualized object, or when she's not even presenting herself. But right? they're still viewing her as one. Yes. Talele will sort of, like, commandeer those aesthetics with her camera moves, right, and how she frames everything. And she will do it in a way that ultimately, ultimately ends up in, in some sort of subversion or prove some sort of point about it. And, uh, you know, I think, I think it could be construed as maybe being a fairly obvious thing to do, but it, it never doesn't work in the scenes, I don't think. And I think it demonstrates a type of control and organization to this movie that helps me feel comfortable with the idea that it's so messy. I know that they're doing this deliberately and that this movie works because visually it's very well organized in that way. Each scene has these different things that are being done with the camera that are like, okay, I know I'm in safe hands and this movie is making clear decisions. It's not just a mess. And then we have this particularly uh, sadistic bugger, as they might say in Australia. Yes. You know, 
As they do. He's going to shoot the cow. Not the cow. God, why would you ever shoot the cow? She has the strongest emotional reaction to the cow's death. You mean compared to her boyfriend's? Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I would say that the boyfriend and the cow are about equal. Yeah, probably. And that's okay in my book. Like the things like that for the comic book interludes of just like, that's quirky, it's fun, the this is me unconscious bit. Like Yeah. And we're going to talk more about the comic interludes and the, the role that those play. Because I think even though you can tell it's a band-aid for issues with the production. We ran out of money, we forgot to film. Yes. I think it still ends up working. Yeah. And again, we can argue about whether or not that, were, that was their intent or whether they had a different intent and that somehow like was a supplement to it that aided it. But ultimately, when you watch it, I think it works. And here's another interesting thing scene. She's also going to use her sexuality to engage with them here. And uh, those first two scenes, again, are going to continue the pattern of coding where we know that this movie is sort of uh, about gender and sexuality and how those two things interact with one another. Because in almost every scene where we interact with water and power, there is... Again, part of them is always going to be associated with their masculine ideology yeah. and their need to regulate and be oppressive. Because <laughs> this is a scene that's repeated frequently. Yeah. Where somebody is approaching her in a creepy way that's very regulatory and controlling, but also is has a, in this scene it's explicit, but a subtext of sexuality, and then she uses that to her advantage to get through the situation. <laughs> and in that sequence, um, I mean, in the article I referenced, they even compare it to an idea of like vagina dentata where he mentions teeth. Oh, God. And then he, and then she opens up her legs and kills him. Yeah. It's like this interesting moment. But the other interesting moment we can talk about is how this movie, so we talked about how quickly it does away with the I revenge trope. I forgot about trope. teeth. Sorry. Okay, keep going. <laughs> I was having a lot of flashbacks. So this movie does away with the revenge trope, right? But also the other thing it doesn't do is that nobody actually sexually assaults her through that, throughout this entire movie. Yes, which would diminish the film to yes. a large degree. Um, <laughs> fucking Malcolm McDowell. God, he's so funny. Right off the set of uh, Home Alone 4, The Holiday Heist. What? Yeah, he was the villain. Oh, don't even say it. Yeah, he was the villain in that. But this line is great. <laughs> It's it's great because the movie has this amazing approach to like turning the like high rhetoric that the villain always has to use into yeah. like a gendered thing as well, and it it goes with what the article is talking about. Where God, this is just too fucking funny because what he says makes no goddamn sense. Yeah, no, he's just like poetry. Uh, no. <laughs> for what? Okay, she. So he. For anyone who's not watching this movie, he asks, "How many of our men did you kill?" And she says, eight. And then. Jesus Christ. This is just too funny. She says eight, and then he goes, eight. Eight. It goes off. Hateful eight. He goes off on this, like, Look at the stars and devastate. And then he kneels next to her and goes, abandon all hope ye who enter here. And she's like, what the fuck are you saying? (laughs) She's like, if you want to torture me, spank me, look at me, go ahead. But if you're going to keep going with this poetry, just fucking shoot me. Yes. And it's funny, and it's interesting because it, it reveals the rhetoric that he's using as being gendered, like yeah. I said. And l- something that this article points out is how you have ideas of frivolousness, of uh, shallowness, of superficia- superficiality, commonly in culture being associated with women, more so with men. But then you have things like depth, intelligence, seriousness, right? Logic being associated with men. And I think that carries that out as well, where it's like, that character is the embodiment of that self-seriousness and self-imposed logic on everyone else. Yeah, well, is- he comes across almost like in a modern way of like a 17-year-old philosopher on Reddit who's just like, oh, I'm so smart and intelligent and everything, who's never had a contact with a woman, just be like, mm, Yeah, soon to up. be incel. Yeah. A man going their own way, if you will. <laughs> That's what Malcolm McDowell is. And he's both contemptible, but also you just hear what he's saying, and it's just fucking hilarious. Because it's so fucking stupid. He's <laughs> just like, shut the fuck up. 
Oh, man. Oh, and here we're going to get the wonderful Naomi Watts, who yes. has never been bad in any movie ever. She is embarrassed about this movie, apparently. Yes, and I, to you, Naomi Watts, I say you have nothing to be embarrassed about whatsoever. Like, <sighs> But this was right at the beginning of her career. I also read that she had to uh, uh, go for this role nine times. She had to audition for it. Really? Really? You're going to make Naomi Watts audition nine times? Well, this was very early on in her career. I think before this, the only real thing I know that she was in was she was... Girl on the screen get in off matinee. Of, get off of me, discount John Travolta. He does look like a John Travolta clone that got yeah. fucked up in the L. Ron Hubbard laps. <laughs> he looks like John Travolta from The Devil's Reign when he got his eyes removed. Oh, this is a super interesting scene. There's no way in, in the time frame of this scene that we're going to be able to talk about everything interesting that's going on with it, but I'm going to point out, because we're going to come back to it after, listen to the announcements coming over the loudspeaker, because it's interesting. And I think it's it's a very subtle detail that you can miss if you're not paying attention. But I think it adds a, a whole new layer of depth to this movie. Um, so again, we have a yet another cliche scene in which women are usually sexualized. And once again, the camera co-ops those aesthetics. Except this time, it's it's interesting and kind of... Uh, maybe you could say it's an example of defamiliarization. Um, but she's getting sprayed with this sort of like baby powder instead of water. And again, you have to keep your clothes on when you're in these showers, right? Because they only wash the work uniforms. Yes. And again, remember, water is very valuable in this world. Yeah. This movie really takes... It, its premise and sort of setting are very generic, but it takes the idea of water very seriously. And that's going to relate to what was coming out over that loudspeaker. But this is also a moment that I really responded to the first time I watched it and why I felt like this movie... It just made me feel good. It made me want to get on the movie's side... <laughs> Because we have this moment where she's going to stick up for Naomi, Naomi Watts, right? And I think it might be a challenge to describe, but I think it's super interesting and very well done. Because, again, in the comic books, I'm not familiar with them, but I get the impression that she's, she has a more of a polymorphous sexuality. Yeah. But in this movie, it's not at all concerned with her sexuality. And the way she kisses Naomi Watts is very irreverent and sort of done, I don't know, in a slight, in a more platonic way. The fact that the movie, I guess the thing that it is, what it is, is that the movie does not at all stop to comment on her sexuality in this moment. No, it's just like, <laughs> it's almost like, obviously she was doing it because she saw another woman right. in distress. And that was a way to get her out of it. But also, like, she took pleasure in the act and was enjoying it as yes. well. So but when the, Naomi Watts tries to, like, instantly, like, almost pull a no homo moment of yes. just, like... She doesn't let it happen. Like, no. <laughs> Tank Girl doesn't let her get the no homo moment. But the more interesting thing is that there's no indication necessarily that Naomi Watts is aggravated or, like, repulsed by that. No, but she... she leaves, but it's more because she's shy. You get the impression. You know what I mean? So it's almost like even doing avoiding the no homo moment is something that is validating toward the Naomi Watts character. And I think in our pre-screening, you put it very well where, again, we see her do this, right? Yeah. It's a very dramatic moment where they meet for the first time. And yet the movie, it's not like they're set up as romantic partners or anything. The fact that it spends utterly no time commenting on her sexuality is great because like you said, the phrase you used is that it does not at all try to offer up her sexuality as something that can be packaged or categorized for audience consumption. Yes, Tank Girl is not for you. She's not... <laughs> her sexuality is not for you to try to place yourself in so you could just be like, oh, well, I maybe I could hook up with Tank Girl if I was in here, or just like... There yeah. is no room for the audience to navigate her sexuality because the movie just lets her be in the driver's chair. Yes. And... It's, I think it's easy to miss if you're not looking at it. But that scene is really important because it sets that up. And again, we're going to learn throughout this entire movie that romance is always something that happens in the background. Because there is romance in this movie, but it yeah. happens in the background. It is guided by Tank Girl. And it, it is never at any point the main focus of a scene, you know? And it has to do with this movie's commitment to irreverence. It's 
its commitment to setting up uh, Tank Girl ultimately as the ca- the character who cannot be regulated in any way, right? That is ultimately yeah. the the goal of this movie, where she cannot be regulated in any way, and that includes by the audience, <laughs> which is fucking Malcolm McDowell with his water gun. Which a water gun is like the ultimate symbol of just like this accomplishes nothing. <laughs> and it, it's so it. fucking expensive <laughs> in this world. I'm a man with my mm. water gun. He's just shooting it yeah. in the air. <laughs> it's hilarious. Um, but again, we're talking about the irreverence of this movie and we probably should have started it this way, but the reason why part of the plot inconsistencies and the continuity inconsistencies do not bother me at all, because if we set up tank girl as this character who ultimately the goal of this movie is showing her as somebody who cannot be regulated in any way by some sort of masculine, um, oppressive system or logic that also extends to plot logic that extends to our expectations of realism, the logic of realism, that extends to continuity between shots, right? Yeah. She violates all those things that you would expect from other movies because this movie genders those things as masculine and that can't control her, right? So she disrupts the fabric of the movie. And that's why when you say this movie is messy or that it's all over the place or it's one thing or the next or that it doesn't really make sense, I think you're not actually meeting the movie halfway because the movie steers into that and that is part of her like feminine energy to avoid regulation. It includes the plot. And that is the movie, the level the movie is operating at. And that's also something that's discussed by the, the article at, at a pretty great length. And I think it's a really interesting article because of that. The way he talks about like seriousness and plot logic as gendered masculine. Yeah, sorry. I just remembered who this, he reminds me of John Travolta in Face Off. That's just like the creepy, weird, overly touchy vibe hmm. that I'm getting. Does he ever touch her face? He's trying. He keeps trying <laughs> to and she keeps pulling away. Hmm. I don't know. Do you think John Travolta is touching somebody's face now? Yeah, uh, somewhere, some dude at an overnight gym in LA. You know, that question is evergreen because no matter where, what point in time you're listening to the sat listener, the answer is yes. <laughs> Constantly. Not just when we recorded it, but also when you're listening. Even after he's dead. Yeah. He'll still be touching your face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we have another reference to cats this time. She references a ton of shit, Tank Girl. Yeah. You want to go see cats after this, Austin? Just drive to New York? Not particularly. Have you, do you know anything about cats? <laughs> I know it's a... You know about the memories all alone in the moonlight? No, I, I do know about the magical Mr. Mistopheles, but... Okay. I don't know if that's part of cats, because I haven't seen cats. You bring that up as if it's part of cats, and I don't know. It is part of cats. Or is it part of cats? Who knows? Oh, Who God. cares? Again, that's a, probably a very explicit way of, of showing how the authority is gendered masculine. All of this might be very obvious to some of our listeners, but apparently a lot of people missed the boat on this, right? So like when she says things like, sometimes when you're thinking about breaking the rules, you just got to say, daddy, is that all right? <laughs> right? That's like, oh God, her delivery is really funny here. Oh, I love my job. I love it. <laughs> um, but again, this all seems very blatant to me and I don't understand. Um, why it was missed, but there's it's just constantly in every scene is great. This is probably another good moment that we're going to get some really great dialogue in the scene, which we'll pause for. But I do want to go back to the lines coming out over the loudspeaker about recycling bodily fluids. Okay. And this is also something that's pointed out in the article I mentioned where they talk about how water becomes this image that is very much associated with I'm sorry, I have to pause for this line. <laughs> this line is so great. This is some of the best back and forths in the movie. He's just trying to be serious, and he, she turns it into a sexual thing to make him uncomfortable. Well, yeah, she, he's like, his entire goal, despite controlling 95% of the water in the entire world, apparently, Yeah, and like being basically the dictator of the world, he just wants to break her. He just wants to like... Well, even in reference to just her, yeah. he doesn't even want to kill her. Yeah. He just wants her to work for him. Right. Or just like admit that like he's, she's finally defeated. Yes. That's why we mentioned it at the beginning that we're going to see that scene sort of play out again with her and her boyfriend. But we were talking about how like her interactions with Malcolm McDowell for the rest of the movie are kind of like 
an extension or repetition of the original scene with the boyfriend. Only now the game has been flipped because it's very much like a, a game, right? And it's almost equally sexually explicit. Yes, but they were both consenting in the scenes yes. with the boyfriend. So now it's different, right? So we get the sex game at the beginning and then we get the rest of the movie, her relationship with Malcolm McDowell is a repetition of that. Only now he's the representation of that uh, masculine, oppressive ideology that is trying to truly control her without her consent or anything like that, right? And this that's why this movie really, I think, feels like a battle of the sexes is because it establishes that backbone and it happens over and over throughout the rest of the movie until she ultimately wins the game at the end. But one thing I didn't finish my point about the water, right? So the article talks about how water is like this fluid image that represents the non-regulatedness of the feminine energy that is present in Tank Girl's category, in her uh, character. She also has heterochromia. That's interesting. Um, but I, I sort of really agree with that. Water is very prevalent throughout this entire movie. And the first time I watched this movie, I was very, I remembered that line where they're talking about recycling your bodily fluids and stuff like that, because that struck me as, as very conspicuous and a very interesting detail to add for just two seconds, you know? And, um, the way it's associated with like feminine energy and just something that isn't regulated is something that plays out in other situations as well, where you have her trapped in the freezing ice room, right? Um, the frozen ice room and she's trapped in a straight jacket and it's sort of maybe akin to the way ice has been solidified, right? And they're trying to break her or, uh, just the, how valuable water is in general. And we're going to see that play out a lot too with the, uh, our, our rippers when they show up later. Water is something that is freedom from regulation and it exists in a continuum with itself and is not necessarily definable or not able to be pinned down. And I think that's an interesting sort of thematic connection. You were introduced to, well, we, I guess we were introduced to the idea of the Rippers in the very beginning of we the see film, it here. but we see the utter devastation they can cause yeah. right now. And the other th weird thing we noticed is how that, we sort of talked about how that was maybe similar or reminded us a little bit of Starship Troopers. And I was wondering specifically if Starship Troopers in its aesthetic and that scene in, in its aesthetic might somehow be like aesthetically referencing the Gulf War. Cause it's still yeah. sort of recent at this time. And also I think, you know, the first Gulf War, I guess we have to say now. <laughs> well, <laughs> Jesus. Um, it's also sort of, known as the first war that was kind of quote unquote fought on television. Yeah. Even more so than Vietnam. Yeah. Because we were talking about yesterday, Vietnam was the first televised war, but because of government regulation and also the technology at the time, like we only saw footage that like yes. happened a year before. It was like, still mediated very yeah. thoroughly. Whereas it's not that the Gulf war wasn't mediated. It just, at that point in time, it existed in a 24 hour news cycle. Yeah. By that point. Right? So like we could see like footage of, like of, enemy forces quote unquote being bombed and it was covered from start to finish yeah live on yeah. cnn like it was a whole teledrama that played out for american audiences which was weird for some reason this shot reminds me of fucking jurassic park at the beginning that'd be a great thing for du jurassic du world du three du <laughs> jurassic du world three tank girl is just in the cage and she like gnaws off a man's arm <laughs> And the Australian is like, shoot <laughs> And they just keep missing. And then she punch, punches Chris Pratt and breaks she, his nose. I know she thinks Malcolm McDowell is dead, but like knowing Tank Girl's character, like I feel like she would like dig that thing out of her leg <laughs> immediately after she's free. Because it is. Oh, the tracker? Yeah. As much as of a, as much as like this movie doesn't give a shit about plot, like that thing technically is the driving force of the the plot. Kind of, it'll come back at the end. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the only reason that things keep going shitty. It's the only reason that water power keeps showing up wherever she is. Like, and they know what she's want. Yeah, she wants. But anyway. Now we get raccoon, not raccoon, <laughs> kangaroo. There we go, people. I mean, I guess they're kangaroo. This is a very Australian movie in a lot of ways. And they are, that, what do you mean you guess they're kangaroo? Like they are. Well, I mean, they're also people, but one of them, Booga is, is he a dog or was he a human? 
I don't even know. Booga is the most sort of mixed of all of them. And that's also going to be something that has an interesting subtext that we'll talk about once we're introduced to that character. Jet Girl. Jet Girl. Is Jet Girl big in the comics? Uh, she like a sidekick? No. Jet, Jet Girl and Submarine Girl, I think they show up in like some of the comics, but like they're not regular characters. It's always more about Tank Girl and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Yet again, it's not, it's very hard to think of Tank Girl as a stereotypical like superhero comic book thing. It's not yes. like, okay, let's go get our sidekicks and take down this week's villain. It's yeah. just like, no, I'm driving through the wasteland and this shit happens and I'm going to do this and explosions and boo ba dee ba Now I'm going to plant a fucking garden and use the flowers to add them to my gun. Yeah. Something random or strange like that. It's yeah, yet again, which is why I think like the structures of the traditional comic books are very anarchic. So like, I don't, I'm not entirely sure if it was their intention, like I said before, but it kind of works for this particular movie for yeah. it to be such a clusterfuck. When, like, well, it's interesting you mentioned that because we talk about how she uses th- this sort of concept of pastiche. She's constantly referencing other cultural objects. Yeah. Well, like she does like a Jaws on, thing later. We got the Baywatch thing a little yeah, bit Yeah, later when we see the Rippers for the first time, she goes, oh my God, it's the Elephant Man. Yeah. <laughs> And then this is just fucking weird. This is probably the first time she really blatantly violates the laws of continuity because it makes no sense that she has a huge ass cigarette holder. I want one of those so badly. I think as soon as you become a millionaire, if you're a man, you get a monocle or one of those like tiny binoculars that you use to watch opera. And then if you're a woman, you get a long, dainty cigarette holder. I'm not part of the rich person's club, though, so I'm not entirely sure. I think you're the only person in this room that thinks that's cool. I don't, think it, I, I don't think it's cool. I think it's over the top, stupid, and gaudy. Um, like that John Travolta movie? <laughs> Which one? Gaudy. Uh, <laughs> New York, the biggest city in the world. Hey, have some class. <laughs> Grab a slice with your girl. Go watch the movie. Sit down in the gaudy. Enjoy yourself. Relax. Have a good time. This is my movie. Please don't kill us, Gambino crime family. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, we're going to talk about this off air. No, it's Excuse fine. Me. You guys, if you guys want some, want a free hit, I'm fucking not. Richard Kuklinski's ghost is going to come out. Just come fuck, out of the just grave fucking and kill us. me. So this is an interesting moment, not at all related to the Gambino crime family, but because um, this is the first time she is really going to hijack the plot and, and also. The tank. In the tank. Well, no, she hijacked it earlier. Well, she tried to and then almost got killed by cyanide, I guess. But the point is that at this point, she's going to derail the plot. And we see this explicitly. So what's happening? What is the plot moment happening here? Nothing. She's, yeah. She is stalling the plot. And that's part of why Naomi Watts is like, what are you doing? No, we we, get out of here. the plot needs to happen. Come yes, on. she might. Naomi Watts might as well be saying that the plot needs to happen. What are you doing? And Tank Girl is like, fuck the plot. <laughs> right? And that's what's happening. And she's also... She is also going to motivate this comic transition. So when we mentioned earlier that we're going to bring up the comic stuff more, this is how. The comic transition is not all the time. Oh, that's a funny cross-eyed stare from Naomi Watts. But the comic transitions, and this doesn't happen all the time, but frequently what happens is that they are motivated by Tank Girl. So not only does she derail the plot and send it sort of careening off a cliff into a different direction, she literally like breaks the live action diegetic space to the point where it has to go into a cartoon like this. The reason it's a cartoon right now is because tank girl didn't want to follow the plot. Does that make sense? Yeah, to a degree. Um, that's also a creative way of talking about how they didn't film. the scene. <laughs> yes, but this works better than if they did it live action. Yeah, true. And the fact that it connects to a scene that didn't really have anything to do with the previous scene also makes it work better. They, this is a patchwork job, but it actually winds up being more interesting potentially than the alternative. Well, yeah, the director said there was like a solid hour that was cut from oh this Oh, my film. God. So, like, there's a lot of lost footage for this movie. And then, like, even then we're talking about, like, all the stuff that they didn't film. So, like, I... I, wa- I can't even imagine an hour. But I mean, just think of that comic, right? Yeah. The, even the aesthetic is so fluid and not attached to reality, right? And that's everything about this movie. It's, it's irreverent, 
It has no time for realism, logic, or oppressive logic of the plot or of continuity. And Tank Girl will drive the plot or the movie in different directions whenever she feels like it. And that's why the messiness is okay. That's why it's more than okay. Yeah. It, it works in the movie. And then we have... Uh... <laughs> oh, boy. What? This guy. The fucking guy who runs the knickknack shop in Gremlins shows up to provide cybernetic. Reply. No, it's not him. I know, but it just reminds me of him. Oh, I always forget his name. Hold on. I actually saw a good movie with him recently called Black Widow, which was directed by Bob Raffles. Raffleson. Oh, that takes place in the MCU, right? Uh, no, <laughs> but it does have Deborah Winger. Hold on. Black Widow, but he's in that movie. It is beautifully lit. Deborah and Winger. I'm just going to say this. Deborah Winger. 100,000 liters of water. Can we water. get Deborah Winger? James Hong is his name. He's a very recognizable uh, character actor from a lot of movies, good movies in the 80s and then 90s here as well. And then, oh, Malcolm McDowell never stops philosophizing and saying stupid things. By the way, the other thing we pointed out in the pre-screening is that apparently you have a thing for movies where yeah, water is just people extracted. Are, people are killed and their blood is turned to water. Um, yes, because this, this in the post-apocalypse, because this is the second movie <laughs> where this happens this after Turbo Kid. quite a bit better than Turbo Kid, I'm going to say. She's laughing while saying, put it down, it's not funny. Because it is. <gasps> it's the monster and Doris Day. Rest in peace, Doris Day. That was weirdly timely. Unless you killed her. Did you kill Doris <laughs> yes. Day specifically so we could capitalize off it? Yes, I decided I was going to do this movie. Oh, man. Well, here we get Rain Lady. I think Rain Lady is also an interesting character. Because if we're going to talk about how water is associated with different ideas of feminine energy, Rain Lady, I think, maybe could be construed as a certain type of feminist that... Okay, we'll talk about it in our... This is just parody, by the way. Anyone who doesn't think this is in a Mel Brooks-type movie at this point, after she just bonked Rain Lady on the head, I don't know what movie you're watching. Yeah. But it works. So I don't know what your expectations are at this point. But Rain Lady, I think, is interesting because she might be seen as a certain type of... <laughs> this could have been useful like any other point in the movie, the lie detector. <laughs> oh, it never comes up again either. Yeah, that jet girl has... So whatever, fuck it. But the point is... She's lying, and she's Rain Lady, again, associated with feminine energy and fluidity, the water. Yeah. Um, and they're at a place called Wet and Wild. But she is maybe seen as a certain type of feminist who's like, I don't know, like an Edenistic type of feminist. Maybe discussed in, in, through the lens of like uh, the Cyborg Manifesto, that essay that we used in discussing... Um, uh, Liquid Silver. Tetuo, the Iron Man. Yeah. Right? a certain type of people who operate very in a deterministic way in opposition in a binary operating by the oppressive masculine logic. Right. And that's maybe what rain lady is seen as doing. I think, she's I think an interesting she was, character. I think, yeah, I think she was supposed to be a submarine girl in the, Oh really? Yeah. In the oh, original script. That's strange. At any rate, I still think she works at least uh, however much she appears in this movie. And then we get the real moment that they launch into their, like, this is putting on the outfit sequence. This is putting on the this. outfits, making, making what was water and power is theirs. Yes. In their own way. In, and they're doing it at a place called wet and wild. <laughs> Again, it all connects. It's all connected. It's not <laughs> incredibly obscure or hard to figure out, but it's all connected and it works. I love like tank girl has this, like the comics too, but like, just because, like, the shape of her tank is never consistent. It's always, like, over the top and ridiculous. But, like, yes. this is fun. I like this. Also, uh, we are aware of all the Gwen Stefani conspiracy theories, I guess you call them. I don't know if Gwen Stefani has ever referenced this movie explicitly. But, yes, we understand and we agree. Gwen Stefani dresses like Tank Girl. <laughs> At least movie Tank Girl. Yeah, <laughs> very much so. But again, this is just carrying on everything we've seen so far. Just the complete pastiche of things, right? We see Salvador Dali and apparently Immanuel Kant. Yep. His name is on the license plate, <laughs> but I don't know. So everything about this movie is embodied in the sequence. It's not a plot sequence. It's all about style over quote unquote substance, right? But the style is gendered feminine and that's why it feels subversive and exciting and why it works.
Now, let me ask you, what do you think of the uh, casting of, of uh, Lori Petty? Oh, more water. There you go. Um, Tank Girl is one of those things that I don't know if like, so this is going to be a different thing, but like if we're talking about, uh, like alternative, like punk goth type, uh, woman casting roles, there's things like, um, a recent example would be the girl with the dragon tattoo okay. trilogy where, oh, okay. Yeah. There, I have acting preferences like i i have actors i could say that like oh yeah i would love if they played this and it's like oh i prefer this person's performance more than that tank girls is unique where there aren't like many actresses that i could think of off the top of my head that'd be just like yes you would be a baddest fucking tank girl but at the same time i think the way she performs this role is perfect for the tone this movie is going for. Right. Cause I think pretty much like if you wanted to like, cause we were talking about Hellboy, how that movie's a pretty dead on telling of the seat of destruction. Mm -hmm. It's fucking like impossible to do a dead on telling of tank girl. Well, you have to take it in a direction. Yes. Yeah. So for the direction this movie is going in. Yes. I think it's a yeah, good casting. And we've also arrived at the Liquid Silver Club. Yes. Where once again, we see the camera very explicitly uh, utilizing the aesthetic of the male gaze in a very obvious way, especially here. Um, but also, this is something that's going to become more interesting retroactively once we're introduced to the Rippers, I think. And this is something that, again, is discussed a little bit in this essay, where this is, we are now entering a set. Oh my God, those girls are on like a carnival ride over there. Do you see that? Yeah. Oh, Jesus, be careful. Extreme pole dancing. <laughs> oh God, hold on for as long as you can. It's not them that's dancing around the pole. It's the pole that's spinning and they just hold on for dear We life. are coming up on what might be my favorite sequence in the movie. Honestly. Sure. And then this is an obvious sequence here. Yeah. Oh, I guess there's, there are bare breasts here. Yeah. In this moment. Um, I just saw that woman's belly moving. So I guess... Those are extras in there. But uh, I, this is a very blatant moment. It was like, we're going to tell you how to look. This machine is yeah. going to tell you how to look, how to please men. And then, no. <laughs> but uh, the Liquid Sky sequence is interesting because uh, this is also a place where we see, like, the the role, the traditional male-dominated gender roles are being very heavily asserted here. And the way that Tank Girl is going to approach blowing it up is very interesting to me. <laughs> um. Well, she's going to turn it into like just fun and take down the authority figure and make her take part in it, whether she wants to or not. And then yeah. it all kind of goes to hell to the point where they forget the original mission of why they're there. <laughs> but, it, yeah. It, she, she, her charisma is real and it takes effect pretty quickly. And again, we get more of the metal guitar theme. Yeah. Okay. This is very Gwen Stefani <laughs> looking almost. What? Lock up your sons <laughs> and then Iggy pop. Oh God. I guess. I mean, why not? I don't know. Yeah, definitely. Why not? Fun fact, that was actually Jennifer Lawrence impersonating Iggy Pop. Pretty good. Pretty good, I gotta say. Was that a knockoff Luigi? Oh, Phantasm Ball. <laughs> Jesus, look out, Iggy Pop. You should have watched that movie. <laughs> and this is also an interesting point to bring up where she... Uh, Tank Girl is also not. <laughs> Whoop. She is, again, really good physical comedy. One thing we talked about is like how fun it would have been to see like a silent comedy version of this. Because Tank Girl is just like she fucks up all the systems and everything and all the rules. I just picture her, picture her in like a factory, like in modern times, just fucking up all the conveyor belts and everything. It'd be great. But anyway, it is all, also interesting to talk about how uh, Tank Girl is not confined to the mother position either. Yes. We sort of forget about Sam for a while until we learn about her again. You know, the movie isn't really concerned with Sam and neither is Tank Girl until she picks up Sam again. Yeah. Sam's like, what the fuck are you doing? And again, she's still not committed to Sam in the sort of normal mothering way we might expect when she says, I'd rather she die well, later on. Yeah, but like, because we think it is like, and she does play a mothering role to Sam, but she also kind of plays it in this fucking insane apocalypse. Like, this is how much motherly love you could possibly expect to get. From well, it does not, 
it is never something that restricts her. Yes. She does it absolutely of her of her own will, and it is never a burden for her. Cole Porter, 1928. Yes. So this is this is the fascinating moment of this this entire sequence. Where if we're talking about the traditional male gaze aesthetic, and we're talking about in reference maybe to Laura Mulvey and her famous essay, uh, Visual Pleasure in Narrative Cinema, and how it establishes the guidelines for what the male gaze might be in movies. Um it also talks a lot about subject position of that gaze and why this scene is so in- interesting is because it it's in the setting where we have the male gaze take place very, very rigidly and, and strongly in that sort of more patriarchal traditional way. And yet we're going to have Tinker will start a performance of a very, of a song that I think is very um, evocative of like old school ideas of romance. Yeah. And it's going to be flipped on its head and not only is she going to be in charge of the performance for the ma- male audience and the male onlookers and the male gaze, she's going to force them out of their subject position where they are hidden, right? And force them to participate in the performance. And furthermore, they're going to like it. <laughs> so now this song that is maybe something that's old school and associated with this sort of antiquated idea of the oppressive regulating masculine ideology is something that is now consensual and is particip- everybody is participating equally, although she is still running the entire show. It's very interesting and well done. Uh, this is fun, though. Yeah. How could you dislike this entire scene? <laughs> it is really fun that it just becomes like a Busby Mer- Berkeley musical here out of nowhere. And again, I just want to emphasize, too, that uh, if you're, if we're going to talk about the male gaze, a big part of that is how the male is not looked upon, right? It's the blue velvet Frank Booth thing where he's like, don't you fucking look at me. You know, the male is not gazed upon, but the fe- the female position is the one who is the spectacle and is being looked at. <laughs> that, that scene always makes me laugh. The, but, what the hell is that? Oh, sounds like Cole Porter, sir. But uh, yeah, so the female position is the one being looked at, Right. And she flips that by refusing to allow them to be invisible. She forces them. They're not on the stage, but they're no longer, they're no longer out of the frame. You know, they have to participate. And it's just really interesting. It's also an interesting moment if we're going to talk about like the pastiche structure of this movie and how even though she collects different cultural objects and it's pastiche in that way, but it's also pastiche because this movie is very episodic. It's also kind of a pastiche of like different genres that it's mixing, it becomes this Busby Berkeley musical out of the blue. Yeah. And then it just goes back to being something different. The plot catches up with them, unfortunately. And And that's also something that stops the fun. Yeah. And then they respond to it again. Yeah. So it's very interesting how this works. It's like this very interesting back and forth that's gendered on both sides. And then also I think, you know, something where you talk about the mixing of genres and that it references something that pops up in movies and uh, that are sort of, discussed in terms of queer criticism and like the idea of queering of genres, right? And anything that does not fit into the very reductive and um, shallow categories and regulations that are set up by a dominant ideology is going to potentially be seen as queering the boundaries of those things. I think this movie does that. Well, you described this movie at one point as queer punk, um, which I think it is to a degree, but... I definitely get the impression based on what I read online that this movie's, I don't know, the way it it features Tank Girl's sexuality is far toned down yes. from the comics. And I think I like the way it looks here. I like that there's no gratuitous nudity. Well, I think N- uh, there's, nudity. there's a difference between illustrated art and visual art because you can stylize nudity in a certain yeah, way in comic books to make it non-sexualized or sexualized on their terms. But in a movie like this with a real woman playing Tank Girl, I think it would be very hard to sort of present that in the same way. Of the and at the, the very the least, it definitely would have been fucked up if a man was directing this. Yes. Thank God Rachel Talele made <laughs> this movie. I don't know how much other movies she's done. I don't know it, how this influenced her career as a film director. I know she's done a ton of TV, but I don't know. I hope she gets a chance to direct more stuff. Because I think it's very well done. (laughs) 
But at any rate, I, th- I think, you know, this movie is, I think I would say it's kind of queer punk, but again, it's, it's not necessarily trying to explore that so much as it's just committed to the fluidity yeah. of her sexuality well, I know and my, not trying to categorize I know it. the friends I have that do like this movie are definitely in the LGBTQ community. Yes. I mean, even though I would, I would be hesitant to really like say it's like definitively a queer punk thing. That's not the same as like, I definitely understand why people of a certain community would gravitate towards this movie. Cause it's like, it still offers that type of energy. Yeah. Oh God, look out for that fucking hair dryer. Yeah. Well, to be fair, it's pumping out nitrous. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Stan booga. Winston's. No, that's not Booga. Of course it's Booga. Everybody's Booga. No, that's the one we think is Doug Jones. Yeah, one of these people is Doug Jones. We can't stop doing movies with Doug Jones. It's movies with Nazis or Doug Jones well, or both. If I have to choose, I'll choose Doug Jones any day. But <laughs> Ice T. Ice T is good in this movie. Sure. He he fulfills the role perfectly of of a cop. Uh yeah, of cop who's distrustful of these people and then that doesn't pay off at all. It is really funny how he's the only one who's resistant. And then it seems like when she's like, Oh, who are you? And he's like, I was a cop. It seems to be like an explanation (laughs) of why he's so resistant. And that makes sense. I think all the rippers are really well done. I love the performances. I love the outfits. I think they have great dialogue and I think they have really good character dynamics. Although, weirdly enough, I also think this is the part of the movie where it starts to drag a little bit. It's weird. Yeah. Um, It just becomes something different, and it takes a little bit of time for it to build the steam back up again. But it's always... This movie is never not entertaining. Oh, I'd like something a little bit more Aquarian-related. You know what I mean? (laughs) Prisoner's my ace. I'm iced tea. And then we see Booga wearing the same shirt that uh, Tank Girl was previously wearing which I think that's a UK thing. That's like from Quadrophenia. That's all I know. That is one of the... You ever see Quadrophenia? I have not. It's got Sting in it. It's about the mods versus someone else. (laughs) I don't know. I just realized they're calling the nitrous oxide truth serum. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it is. By the way, we think that one... Hold on. Oh, that's weird. I say we get crumpets and tea. (laughs) Again, it takes a really good director to have a vision for the tone of scenes like this. So it's not completely stupid. Rachel Talele, I think, proves in this movie that she's a very good director. I hope I'm saying her name correctly, by the way. I'm not entirely sure. I think I defaulted to the most fun sounding pronunciation of it. Talele. (laughs) I mean, that looks like it's how it's pronounced. No. Yeah. I am going to look up... I should have beforehand looked up what else she's directed. I th- we think that one's Doug Jones. The one with the... Uh, yeah, the one that looks like the, Doug Jones. Well, he's just skinny. Yeah. He's just very conspicuously skinny, and Doug Jones is probably the skinniest man in any room, <laughs> even when he's time. standing outside. And also the tallest. Oh, but. that's not true. Um, she directed Freddy's Dead. Oh yeah, she directed a few Nightmare on Elm Street movies, didn't she? Yeah. Oh, she directed one of the episodes of uh, Sherlock. She's directed some episodes of Riverdale. Yeah. So she's a big time director in TV. I just don't know if she's oh, done yeah. many. She's movies. doing all of like the DC shows now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So she's a very successful TV director. I just don't know what she's done in terms of. In terms of uh, oh, she's big movies. in the BBC too. Yeah, she's done some Doctor Who. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, here's another really fun detail. They they are custom made shoes for their kangaroo feet. It's like Converse kangaroo. It's yeah. really good. Oh uh, yeah, love that it's detail. Not, you think it would be like you have a Converse and then like you have half of a Converse sewed onto it, but no, they look like they're like distinctly custom made. <laughs> yes, it's very interesting. And once again, she's going to. Tr- I I think it's. What do you think about the sexuality, or not the sexuality, but the way in which the Rippers are portrayed as men? Because they're very lecherous, right? 
but also our lead characters seem more okay with that than at any other point in the movie. And they also seem less regulatory, despite like Ice T's frequent attempts to try to kill them or discredit them. They seem far more accepting of Tank Girl and Jack Girl on their own terms. But they yeah. they still are lecherous. And there's gonna be some interesting like visual stuff too in a few moments. Oh my god, Johnny Prophet, that guy from the beginning. Yeah. I forgot about him. Because it doesn't matter. Yeah, no. The next time we see him, he's dead anyway. But again, spoilers. You know, the Rippers as a group. I don't know how I feel. Because, like, they are lecherous men, but, like, they're also, like, they live in this, like, democratic, weird society. So, like, they let them have a say in things. And, like, they do, despite Ice-T's best protests, let them be part of it. And then when, uh, Johnny Prophet and they also have all these Hooters things and the Playboy yeah. shirt. Like they have a lot of like lecherous sort of things on the wall. It's just Yeah, we have a blow up doll um back there. Yeah, it's a little bit but after different. After Bongo Man and Johnny Prophet are both dead, like Tank Girl and Reggie Kathy. Yeah. I think his name is. Tank How Girl is, and is Jet Girl just like sort of effortlessly take yeah, take over their little group and nobody really protests it. Because they're just like, yeah. Yeah. At any rate, they're they are related to Tank Girl and Jack Girl because um, they too also cross boundaries in a way that is not acceptable by by the yeah. dominant authority. And that's literalized in the fact that they're genetically parts of different animals. Booga more so than anyone else because he's apparently a dog, maybe a human, and also a kangaroo. Or he's just a dog that was so smart that they called him a human. Yeah. But again, another interesting moment where they're talking about first you have to strip, then we get this very lecherous cut to this posing woman in the painting, right? And then we see them peering at at them. It's an interesting change in the dynamic. And I'm not quite sure how the movie wants you to feel about it, except for the fact that it's, at a certain point they become in charge. Well, I think it's like they're the type of lecherous that like, despite being bloodthirsty killers, like we've seen before, they're like, they're slightly more timid in their lecherousness to the point where like tank girl views it as something that they can use to control them. Yeah. At any rate, they still are let. I mean, look at this. Yeah. I mean, we have that disgusting thing. Yeah. Where he's like, Oh God, I dropped it down your shirt. God, let me just grab it for you. Right. That's very like creepy to me. That gets the hair standing up at the back of my neck. But then you have Booga, who's being very nice and polite and just only trying to help because she walked up directly next to him. And <laughs> this character, who's actually Jack Kerouac, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. But again, one of the interesting things we're going to see A here. A cop. I used to work for the Special Victims figures. Music in New York. <laughs> dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ted Smith here, right? So here's going to have a bonding moment with Jet Girl because they're both engineers and they're into engineering. But again, that happens very quickly and that's going to set up a romantic arc for them, but it's very easy to miss because it happens in the background because again, none of the scenes are about romance, right? Yeah. But also... Booga was a dog. It, it, yeah, it's very weird. But the, the interesting thing about the Jet Girl and Ted Smith connection is that it's weird when you see them kind of grow closer together because it's like... We it, it, it's we didn't remember watching it the first time that they had that little interaction where they responded to each other. We just remembered him fake dropping the ring down her shirt, you know. Yeah. So I'm not entirely sure if the movie succeeds in selling their connection as strongly. I prefer the Booga Tank yeah. Girl, but I do think that's sort of what it's trying to go for. I just don't. Maybe they there was a scene that was cut or something, or they didn't get to shoot a moment. But I, I think that is one shortcoming for me. And we're going to set up another scene here where they are once again going to subvert the male gaze in another interesting way. <laughs> this time by literally taking control of it and and driving it instead of being the object uh, that is a spectacle and manipulating it indirectly that way, they are going to be actually taking the camera and choosing what to show it. the fuck 
They're very horny. But then we're going to gacko to the scene that's absolutely... I wouldn't say it's out of nowhere because we've already had a musical number where they're... Well, I mean, if it's... Again, Mel Brooks parody stuff is the way to go with this movie. That's what this movie is. I don't really know what people are expecting. And I guess I can understand why people would not respond to this movie at all or be like, what is this? But it's like, what are you expecting from the movie at this point? Yeah. And like even Jack girl who like started off as like sort of like the passive, like, no, we need to do this because this is what's supposed to happen. Oh, it's going to be funny in this scene. This is probably where the transformation really, truly happens. Yes. But Jack girl at this point has stopped like almost completely questioning tank girl because like whatever the fuck she does just seems to work out. Yes. With this man with the rhino horn of hair on his head. That's a good look. That's going to that's gonna be in in a few years, Max. Yeah. But again, another interesting thing, right? So she's going to lead a subversion of the male gaze again here, just like in the Liquid Silver Club, except this time it's going to be even more dramatic because we're going to set the men up as the sexualized objects. But once again, it's going to be validating for them in a way they seem to enjoy. Right? Yeah. This guy's so excited. Look at his fucking bug eyes. This guy's eyes are so far <laughs> popping out of his head that he's like would scare Peter Lorre. That's how excited he is. But it's interesting to me if we're going to compare this to another movie. <laughs> I love Jack Carl just being like, I can't believe this is fucking working. <laughs> well, she's going to forget the real objective. Yeah. And she gets really gonna, yeah, into this. She's going to be like, oh my God, I love you. I love that line. You're so beautiful. You're making me sick. But if we compare this to maybe like Legally Blonde here, where once again, Ellen that woods in a very charming and upbeat way is going to subvert people's expectations of her. Right. And also subvert like the system that is gendered and against her in this moment here. It's different because L woods will at many points in that move movie do so at the expense of other characters and sort of, treating them like shit or the movie treats them like shit, you know, whereas this movie tank girl is, she is subverting the situation, but she isn't doing so in a way that is validating to the characters yeah. <laughs> to the supposed antagonists. So it's even more effective, you know, it's very interesting how they set up these scenes. Je ne sais quoi. <laughs> Oh, God. Okay. Naomi Watts is really funny. Has she done many comedies? I don't know. I'm not very familiar with her work. I'm sad that she's embarrassed with this movie because you're fun in it. Well, at any rate, she's never been bad in anything. So yeah. even if this movie was bad, I I seriously, I seriously don't think she would have any reason to be embarrassed about any of her roles. Although that's probably wrapped up in part of what makes her a good actor. She takes it seriously. Oh, by the way, uh, this scene is so like reminiscent of Fury Road. Yeah. That's interesting. Is it an Australian thing? (laughs) Well, that's just driving in Australia. Well, they just have the desert. Yeah. And they're like, well, this is the most cinematic thing we've got. So we're just going to drive cars. Well, there are parts of Australia where if if your car breaks down, like you're dead. Yeah. So have fun with that. So... I guess it's just like a national ingrained fear. I'm just like, we need to hoard gasoline and water and yeah. trick out our vehicles with weapons it to defend make them sense. from other people. It doesn't make sense. And everyone here is a criminal. It's like the post-apocalypse. <laughs> Already. Oh my God. And a cassowary. It's like some sort of mutant creature that's going to kill me. It's, it kill me as quickly as it'll just look at me. Cassowaries are horrifying. Oh, it's yeah. like the closest thing we have to a velociraptor on this planet. Yeah. Well, I can like, gash your entire chest open <laughs> instantly with one kick. So, However, I would not be opposed to putting you in a pen with one for a decent like donation or if there's a certain tier of the Patreon. <laughs> get, watch Max approach a cassowary. $500 a month. <laughs> I will. <laughs> That's it? I will fight a cassowary. That's it? That's all you're going at? You think someone's going to pay us $500 for this podcast? Come on. Not then. for the podcast, just to watch you walk up to a cassowary. <laughs> 500 maybe you'll get you an emu. Not a cassowary. And an emu is rude, but it won't kick you to death. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really good stunt, by the way. 
I think this action is pretty is filmed pretty well too yeah. for the most part. From what I understand, she was terrified standing on that thing. But that wasn't actually Lori Petty. No, but there was cuts of it where she was standing on top of oh. that thing. I mean, I would be too. Yeah, that's a that's a tough stunt because <laughs> they're still moving pretty fast. Well, she didn't break any ribs like Ron Perlman did in Hellboy, the, the subway scene. So True, although I still, I cannot believe you when you say that that train was moving at 40 miles an hour. Why on earth would they ever have a train moving that fast? I don't know. That would just fucking turn them into, like, paste. Okay, this is what I was talking about. What? Her on the thing for this scene. Apparently she was not. Oh, yeah. in that moment. Okay, yeah. yeah. And once again, another interesting moment. We didn't talk about it earlier when she first meets the tank, but it goes into like the porno music, right? Yeah. Um, with the guitar, with the wah pedal, <laughs> right? And um, it's interesting that the tank kind of becomes its own character. And interestingly enough, it's like slightly implied in the way her she interacts with it that she also has a type of romantic relationship with the tank. Oh, well, no, she's... It, I mean, the phallic imagery isn't subtle and like... Instant. Yeah, even in that moment. Even, like, yeah. Feeling inadequate, boys. Feeling inadequate. And then when she first sees it, she's just like, it's so big. <laughs> yeah. But it is interesting that that's also like a relationship that she has. I always love scenes like this where like there's a cliff coming up in like five seconds and like 10 minutes later. Oh, just the Spielbergian time yeah. expanding edits. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. God, can you imagine Steven Spielberg cutting a scene together where a character really had to pee? It'd be the most (laughs) triggering thing ever. Be like, oh, my God, he's still not at the bathroom. Oh, God. No, Steven. Are you listening to this, Steven? No. (laughs) What else are you doing? (laughs) Something better than this. Is he? Yes. Is he really? <laughs> I, yes. Max, I'm not ready to take on Steven Spielberg yet. Well, I am. Meet me in the parking Yeah, Meet me in the lot behind Denny's at three o'clock, Steven. I'll take you on. You better watch out because he can afford to bring a cassowary <laughs> with him. No. Just me and you, Steven. I'll fight you. Now we get their, the full acceptance into their group. Well, sort of. Minus iced tea. Yeah. <laughs> he looks so <laughs> mad about it. Oh, man. I think he's good in this movie. And he looks weirdly similar to to uh, John Travolta from Battlefield Earth. Well, it's because he has the least amount of makeup on out of all of them. Because yes. He's iced tea. So he just has the nose and the ears and then not any of the other stuff that make all the, them look so unique. So it's pretty obvious. It's just God, ice too. And talking a about John Travolta so fucking much. Get out of our fucking podcast. Because the second, the second in command looks like John Travolta, and like, I mean, re- critical reception wise, this movie's very <laughs> that's true. similar to Battlefield Earth. God, that is such a shame. It just makes me think of all the other movies that are potentially just we have no idea exist because I don't know. They because they were different and directed by women. Yeah. I mean, that's another interesting thing. I found a neat interview with Lori Petty about this movie, and she talks about why she thinks it got an an R rating, because she talks about the content of the movie, and she's right when she says it's not really too explicit. There's a lot of uh, straightforward discussion of and and sort of, I don't know, attitude towards sexuality. This is a very sex-positive movie, Um, but really in terms of, oh, I like that, Naomi Watts has an upside down cross tattoo now. Oh way. yeah, that's actually a. <laughs> it's an upside down cross tattoo that says Looney Tunes. Oh um, really? Yeah. <laughs> Which, if I remember correctly, a different character in the Tank Girl comics had that exact same tattoo. Well, I think I see something in in one of the comic images earlier where she has a, like a Daffy Duck pin on her outfit. Yeah. Or a patch that she sewed on. Well, at any rate. Yeah, but that that specific tattoo, I, deal. if I remember correctly, another character in Tank Girl had that exact same tattoo, so that's yeah. a small little reference to them. Max and I do this at the bar a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Me and the boys going out to the club. like. <laughs> but we also bring our fake tails. <laughs> fake. <laughs> Austin, I think I don't think I, I don't think I've been 100% honest with you. But uh, yeah, so 
Oh, what the fuck were we talking about? Who cares? There's <laughs> fucking kangaroo people doing line dancing. Oh, I was talking about why Lori Petty thought it was rated R. Yes. And she thinks it, it's mostly because it was just a woman doing these things. And uh, I, I agree with her argument there. It makes sense. She talks about some of the other movies that came out the same weekend. And she, she really does think the movie was really hurt by not having the PG-13. And I think I agree because I think it would, it would have more of an audience today. Again, more of the like slightly uncomfortable <laughs> approach to those two characters. But by the end of the scene, it's clear that Naomi Watts enjoys it Ice- as much as she can because she's a nerd. Ice-T <laughs> is having none of this, though. No. No, uh, Ice-T mm-hmm. has a, a, a non-consensual re- relationship with the concept of having fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can tell that by how great the song is that he puts at the end of the movie. <laughs> Fuck, I hate this. But we were talking about before, I don't think we mentioned while recording that Ice-T got paid $800,000 to be in this movie. I don't know how, how high the budget of this movie was I in will, total. But, I will look it up. but Because uh, I can't imagine the advertising was that high. And back then, advertising wasn't as expensive as it is now. Well, you know what, Max? I haven't really listened to that song, but I'm going to I'm gonna make a bold statement and say that if we're not getting paid $800,000 for this podcast... I don't think he deserves eight hundred thousand dollars for that song, <laughs> but he's. I think he gives a good performance. Oh, it had a pretty decent sized budget, honestly. What was it? Twenty five million. That's a medium sized budget. Yeah, at the time, only earned six million in the box office, unfortunately. Ooh. Oh god, so that's a, that's a complete failure. Oh god, that's brutal. Yeah, that is fucking brutal. That's morbid. <laughs> How brutal that is, but uh. Oh, uh, we completely talked over it, but the mural scene, I think, is really interesting. Oh, yeah, but also Um, we saw them... Was that the scene where we saw them sort of lying next to each other post-coital? I think it is implied post-coital. Yeah. um, Coital. A fun thing that I haven't had a chance to mention yet... Right. ...is that, according to Jamie Hewlett, and one of the big things that he's very upset they cut from the movie, is that they spent $5,000 building a very large kangaroo dick prosthetic... It was a Dirk Diggler fake penis, and I imagine it looked just just the same as as Mark Wahlberg's at the end of Boogie Nights. Yeah, but it it yeah, there was supposed to be a sex scene with Booga and Tank yeah. Girl, and they built. And you know what? I'm glad they cut that because I think that would have just been stupid. And also, you know what? It takes away from that moment because in that moment, even. The focus of that moment is the mural, which I was about to talk about, where, it, again, it's carrying on the idea of water being something that's not regulated, yeah. right? And it's the dream of Johnny Prophet. It's something they're looking for as well. Um, but if you have it, that be an explicit sex scene, then you ruin the thing where, like, Tank Girl and Jet Girl, their romances are always happening in the background of every scene. Yeah. You know? they are Romance is never the objective of any single scene. It is always a very tertiary, secondary objective. Which makes sense because it's yeah. the fucking post-apocalypse. It's not going to be like, well, we're doing this really for love. It's like- well, even more so than narrative logic. I think it makes sense in terms of what they're trying to do with these characters. Yeah, you know, where these characters never ever are defined in any single moment, primarily as sexual or like uh, in terms of like as a romantic person, you know, um, sexual object or, or in terms of their romantic relationship. It's always secondary. But also the way I love that I found I found this is really good comedic timing right here. <laughs> Majority vote. Uh, it's funny. Um, yes, that was committee ISD. Sorry, yes. sorry, cop. Um, anyway, if Brexit has taught us anything, <laughs> it's that the majority doesn't always make great decisions. It, it would if they were Australian. I, I assume. Although they've got their own problems with fucking far right lunatics now. Very true. Um, is there anyone that doesn't? <laughs> At least we can all connect over that, people. But anyway, uh, the other interesting tank, fun fact: about, tank girl would punch a Nazi in the face. That's sure. all I'm saying. The other fun fact about the prosthetic uh, kangaroo penis <laughs> is: uh, I also found what that, other movie do you get to say that though? Right. Well, exactly. That's such a fun thing. Go on though. Um. In the article I found, it also mentions that. But also, uh, that article quotes a, a, an interview with the director, and she also mentions that part of the other weird thing about it is that 
they looked at kangaroo penises, and she, I think she said that they have like they're a little bit different. Yeah, I think she mentioned something about like having like a two pronged head or something, <laughs> and that's the other reason why executives were a little bit like eh? <laughs> about it, and that makes sense to me. Um, so that's just a fun thing. But yeah, I also found that information. But it also weirds me out about like what was the actual rating of this movie supposed to be? Because Lori Petty talks about it as being like this should have been PG thirteen. But PG thirteen movies usually don't have uh well, kangaroo penis. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, that's what I think, because Jamie Hewlett talks about a lot in his interviews how there was an increasing uh disconnect between him and the director. And then the director talks about how she was kind of heartbroken with the fact that there was, she was being forced to do things by the studio that were completely out of her control. Right. And that was causing a rift between her and Jamie. And she's kind of very heartbroken by that because it was just out of her control. And she had to be the bearer of bad news for a lot of things of just like, no, we need to do this now. And we didn't have enough money to shoot this. So the studio's moving this along. So you have to do this now. And she deeply regrets that, but, I don't know. I'd be interested to see. Well, the other the other interesting thing in terms of how that might affect the rating is that I think part of part of the thing about the rating of this movie that the real reason I think it got an R is it's it's sort of accompanying the fact that it's so focused on women, but it's it's the sex part of it. Yeah. This movie is R specifically because it's women being very sex positive. And that this country is prudish enough anyway. Right, the, I'm sorry. The subtitles for this movie are pretty bad, but the laughs and then chortling, chortling in the subtitles. Oh, you is, think that's a funny word? I just I chortle. Like, that sounds like a Pokemon. <laughs> chortle, chortle, chortle. <laughs> um, but yes, I, I I think you know this. Our, the U.S. is scared enough of sex as it is. Yeah. Right. But they are especially scared of sex when it's a woman that's in charge. Yes. When <laughs> when a woman likes sex. Uh, or not when a woman <laughs> likes sex, but a woman in, is control in control of her sexuality. Yes, we almost. I mean, not too recently. Only in the past few centuries, we've burned quite a few women, probably be just because of something like that, right? Well, yeah, that wasn't even just sexuality. That was just women, like you know, having their own spiritual beliefs and <laughs> well, controlling I, I'm, their destiny. This is a whole other conversation. But mostly when I think of the witch trials, I also just think of it being like a bunch of men who have boners because they look at women who are like just kind of groovy. Yeah. And then they blame the boner on the woman. Yeah. That like, or, you won't have sex with me. That Yeah, that or a woman said like no to having sex with them. And then it's just like, oh, that's because uh, her sexual appetite has already been filled by <laughs> fucking the devil. He's fucking a goat. No wonder. Fucking Black Phillip. It is kind of similar to the role the Rippers play in this movie. That's a natural transition right there. Yes. I, I hadn't talked about it yet, but part of the interesting thing with them having a relationship is how even though you might, some people might argue that this movie settles on a type of monogamous bond between them, it is, it totally uh, shirks the expectations and sort of restrictions of how that would play out in other movies because Booga is not a human being. No. Well, and the first thing that we say, like, after they're out of the prison cell, she's just like, oh, is it true what they say about guys with big feet? <laughs> yes. Like, and the fact of the movie maintaining the sex positive attitude and actually hooking her up with Booga is really interesting. And in the article, they call it a post-human take yeah. on their sexuality. And I think it's right on point to say that that is, oh, this is maybe my favorite joke. Where Booga very sincerely is like, no, he's right. He's right. Count Chocula, the guys, the guy in the <laughs> detergent. Um, that's a great moment, but I, I think it's right to say that their relationship is also something that is really crossing the boundaries and, and subverting, uh, sort of heteronormative production, right? That's the phrase that they use heteronormative production and, uh, her relationship with Booga manages to do that without also pigeonholing her into that, into that role in this movie as, being defined by a romantic relationship. Yes. Well, and it would have been very easy for them to just be like, oh, they captured the boyfriend and they turned him into this kangaroo thing, but because she loves him so much, yeah. she's not going to let that get in the way. Never happens. Yes. And all that stuff would have happened if this movie was directed by a man. Yeah. By the way, uh, just another thing about, you know, 
uh, you know, sort of female talent in this movie. We didn't mention it, but it's interesting that Catherine Hardwick is the production designer of this. She would go on to direct a number of movies. Uh, not many of which I've really seen or liked. She directed Twilight, but it's interesting that she's the production designer of this movie. I think the production design is pretty good. I think we as a culture need to move past bashing on Twilight. Like, it's just, okay, whatever. I mean, it's played out, but I don't yeah. think it's any less valid. Well, no, like, Twilight is a thing, yes, uh, but, like, more, more just the actors in it. Oh, definitely in terms of Robert Pattinson and Kirsten Stewart. Yeah. I think they've both pro- proven that they're both excellent actors. Yeah, Kirsten Stewart especially kind of, like, baffles me because I've seen her in other things, and I'm just like... Have you seen Personal Shopper? I have not. You got to watch that movie. We got to do an Olivia Sayas movie. <gasps> we could do Irma Vep. We also, we could do Demon you also Lover. mentioned The Love Witch earlier, which like we yeah. need to get around to watching that. That's an amazing film. Um, that's We're going to do all the movies. Yeah, that's one of my favorite films of the like, past couple of years. I really liked The Love Witch. Uh, but at, at, at any, wait, what were we talking about? We were talking about uh, sexuality and the post-human sexuality. Oh yeah, that that's the term shows. that they use. And yeah. It, and, uh, oh, Catherine Hardwick directing Twilight. Um, but yeah, oh, <laughs> look at the obvious wires. That's fun. But yeah. it doesn't matter because this movie is already all about the artifice and the style. This movie doesn't care about your logic. And it's the just ta- style. The tank is piloting itself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Again, the tank is kind of sentient. It's interesting. I don't know if you're familiar with the indie game Bro Force. Uh, no. It's a fun little thing where they just take various characters from all these different action movies and it's blatantly just stolen from them, but they just replaced their names with bro somewhere in it. So there's Ram bro, Ro bro cop, uh, brominator, just all that type of things. Tank girls in that game. Oh, here's the other repetition of the Alex to large yes, imagery with the bowler Ma- hat, Michael McDowell, which is interesting. I don't know if there's like a clear subtext you can read into that, but it is, I guess it is just interesting to see how this movie shows, shows that imagery again, but also Malcolm McDowell is so conspicuously is just, the authoritative force here now. Yeah. And he's, he's saying he lost his patience, but she lost the fight, but no, he's lost at this point because it was a battle between them to see who would like, yeah, break first basically. And he's already broken. Well, the interesting thing part about it is like, this also just goes further to reveal, Oh, we have to pause for this. Another great moment that would be different if it was directed by a man. Jet. You mean she was a traitor the whole time? No. Nope. Nuh-uh. Didn't happen. And you know what? The fact that she was wrong about that and then the movie holds her responsible for assuming it was Jet, I like that. Because you know what? The movie in this moment is not saying that she's perfect either. It holds her responsible for just assuming that Jet was evil. A traitor, yeah. Yeah. It's like, no, Jet was exactly who you thought she was. Well, yeah, that could be another thing in the movie is it would just be like, sorry, he promised me the, the, to yes. be in charge of the mechanics division. It just would have been yeah. the woman betraying the other woman again. Because you know, something a man was offering her. God, I haven't watched any of the last however many seasons of Game of Thrones since like season two. Oh, but I, I bet that happens a lot. I got farther than that. But as soon I got like halfway through the season after they outran the books and I was just like, oh, oh, oh. You are kind of, you have no idea what you're doing with these characters anymore. And stopped. From what I heard, that was a good decision. How does he itch himself? I'd be very nervous about that Well, problem. does he itch? Because apparently, does he have a brain anymore? I don't is he, know. Is he controlling it from like a Tammy in the T-Rex jello jar somewhere? I don't know, <laughs> like, maybe. I was telling you yesterday that they recently unearthed the R-rated gore cut of Tammy and the T-Rex. I, I just don't care. I do. I would really like to see that. Oh, he slapped her with a fish. That's interesting. We got forgot to properly film this action scene. So. But again, this is just a fulfillment of everything that that his character is, right? Where yeah. now he's actually a hologram and he's just become like a pure image of that ideology where he doesn't even have a corporeal body, right? And that's just his dialogue, right? Like... We were talking about it yesterday. Like, that's there's a whole fucking problem with like systemic oppression of people is that you can't punch it. <laughs> you know, you cannot. You can win victories against them, but like, you can't punch toxic masculinity and the patriarchy in the face. <laughs> yes, you can't do that. That's why it's difficult to deal with, and that's why she's struggling to fight him at this moment. Because if you could, I would help all you ladies out there. I would let, <laughs> I would lift you up so you could punch patriarchy directly. Well, in it's the not face, even but. just that. It's that just to reinforce this metaphor, right? It's just, 
it's not something you can I actually I was making a bad touch. joke. <laughs> you have this Another really important. interesting yeah. moment. This is where I feel like it becomes close to surface level political because you have these things where it's like she should be, she should, like, based on other movies, this character should be dedicated enough to the child and therefore her role as a mother yes. to to behave a certain way and uh, sort of, I don't know, bow down when the child is threatened, but then find a way to overcome it. But she just finds a way to overcome it without ever even conceding to him, you know? Yeah. And that's why it feels near political because she very clear, like that is a very clear, like, I don't know. That's a fine point to put on it. Yeah. I would rather let her die than concede it, concede anything to you. You're out of ammo. And the tank almost like blushes there by turning on the red lights. On the yeah, side. it is kind of like, again, it's just the tank is like a dude. And, and she's got beer. No ammo, just beer. And oh my God, did you? Okay, this is a very, this is a reach. But look at the beer at the bottom left corner. What does the brand say? Spunk. Okay, do you know what spunk means? Yes. In specifically Australia and yes. the UK? So that makes sense. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's good old fashioned jizz. Also a type of water in a certain sense, <laughs> or at least a liquid. Well, yeah. That, I wouldn't recommend drinking it. Why do you think one of the rules was uh, bodily fluids should not be exchanged between prisoners? Yeah, they got to keep that, keep that going. Mm. So it all comes back around. Maybe the movie's doing that deliberately, or maybe Max and I just see the word spunk and we're perverts no it definitely is knowing jamie hewlett it's like 100 percent in line with stuff that would be in the comics i guess that's not also mutually exclusive to us being perverts <laughs> yeah well i didn't say we weren't perverts <laughs> yeah. but i'm saying that yeah. like that being there is definitely just run them over i know you'd get rid no, of no it won't work <laughs> it would work fine because as we see before the rest of his body and again, he's destroyed by water. Is physically, is a physical thing. Even, oh. though, even though the hologram isn't like the rest of his body is perfectly physical. Then we get the very clear yeah. Wizard of Oz-esque comic. And then she, she gives us the line here. Let me ask you, now that we're reaching the end of this movie, sort of, do you think they're going to remake this movie or try to do it again at some point soon? <sighs> it seems like one of those things that like, they could definitely just like slap it like we know the original was bad, but we're going to get a hot up and coming female director to make this girl girl power movie and throw a big budget behind it and try to capture that counterculture spirit. I'm not sure they will, though. Just, is this this is a DC comic, right? No, completely in, independent. Um, oh, OK, it was. Yeah, no, she didn't. Tank. For some reason, I thought it was. No, I wonder who owns the rights to this, though. I mean, I believe MGM still owns the rights to Tank Girl, at least the movie making part. Well, the um, company went through a number of ups yeah. and downs. So. Um, I know the comic that Tank Girl was originally, or the magazine that Tank Girl was originally published in, like that's long since gone out of business. Okay. Um, oh, and Naomi Watts is also going to get her very like definitive ending to her relationship with this character. I'm not sure who currently owns the uh, Tank Girl license. Again, like, how interesting is it that we get this moment with Naomi Watts' character where this, like, I would, I hate this adjective so much, but you might describe her as mousy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Throughout most of the movie, and then by the end, she just shoots this guy point blank in the face. That's why I'm saying the ending of this movie, it's, I'm not quite as certain in, in terms of, like, clearly if we're going to match it up with Anna Biller's definition of what a feminist movie is in her article, it is not as clear and cut and dry as it being specifically political, but that's a big part of it for her. But it's also about exploring their subjectivity and perspective. And I think the way this movie, the, the subtext of this movie boils to the surface, you know, yeah. and at those moments it really bursts through and it makes me like, I don't know. It makes me not 100% certain that this wouldn't fit her definition. She does, answer the uh, comments a lot in those in her, in her blog. So if you're listening to this, I don't want to, 
I don't want to send people to like random internet people to harass her. But if you are interested in her art, like in her blog, we're going to link to it in the show notes. It's a really awesome blog. She writes about a ton of stuff, but she seems to interact with people in the comments, which is cool too. And again, here we have the ultimate finale of this movie where once again, Tank Girl brings us to a comic transition and the water is released and uh, Booga is surfing on it. And uh, Ooh-wee. it this is even more and hectic. We get, the, we get the Joan Jet soundtrack. Yeah, the Joan Jet cover of Let's Do It, which sort of becomes the theme of the movie. Once again, Jet Girl is like, don't go off the cliff. And she's like, fuck you, we're doing it. Yeah. And and uh, it, that coincides with the falling part of Fall in Love. And you get the, it's even more hectic because you get the live action water mixed yeah. with the cartoon. So it's the ultimate appropriate ending for this movie in which again the ultimate theme of this movie is how tank girl won't be regulated and how that attempt to regulate her is gendered as masculine yes and the movie doesn't the movie just sort of ends it's like fuck it we're doing this now yeah um which yet again if you're looking at this as a traditional film i can see why you might say that's completely unacceptable what the fuck the movie's just over now but But again if you reject it for a lot of the reasons that we've been talking about i think I just don't think that's a really valid argument when you watch the movie. Yeah, I get you. Oh, just a quick thing. You were asking about it. Dark Horse techni- uh, currently owns, which is also the company that owns Hellboy. So that's a... So 0 for 1 this year. Dark Horse. On those movie adaptations. So yeah. <laughs> hopefully it's not coming out anytime soon. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I hope we didn't come across as too, like, uh, I don't know, proselytizing in terms of this movie. Uh it was just sort of a unique thing where I remembered not liking this movie. So I thought it would be, I thought we would be on the same page okay. for this, but we ended up being on the same page more or less in a completely opposite way. But it's weird too, because I feel like there's such a lack of internet culture with this movie where I just feel like there should be not only that there should be, but that it seems to lend itself to that. And there isn't. You know, no, 100. and it's just kind of strange to me. I don't understand why this movie doesn't seem to have as much of a strong audience as it should. Maybe it'll take off, you know, as we're recording this for a completely unrelated reason or something. I just, you know, some of the stars seem to be a little bit hesitant talking about it until maybe more recently. And I just, I don't know. It really bums me out that this movie struggled to find an audience because I think it's just good, you know? And uh, while I understand people having a knee-jerk reaction to it at first, I think it's far past the time that we have to reevaluate this movie because this is just a good movie. It's fun. Like, at the very least, it's fun. Yeah. I I would really challenge anybody who does not like this movie and remembers it just being a terrible flop to just look at this as a punk rock feminist (laughs) riot girl wild ride experience rather than a traditional narrative and just sort of view the entire movie through that lens. Right. And then see if you don't have a good time with it. Well, it's, I mean, again, maybe we sound very zealous about this movie and I, I don't mean to give the impression that I think this is like the best movie ever. Oh God, no. I just think it's very like unfortunate the way it's been treated. And I think it's just like, I compare it to other movies in my head that seem to have more notoriety for doing something that this movie actually does. You know, or doing they have a pretense of accomplishing what this movie accomplishes more thoroughly or more effectively. And that being said, as somebody who has read the comics, I do want to get my one thing in here that I think every fun part about this movie, the comics do yeah, kind of do better. And the style of Tank Girl in the comics, which is why the animated sequences, even if they are kind of patchwork, they look great and they okay. work very well. I think that owes a lot to Jamie Hewlett and his style. So while I do really like this movie and I think that it's in a unique position with the fact that because everything was kind of anarchic and the production was. Oh, sorry. We just passed the the credit of Courtney Love and we never <laughs> forgot, but actually I, I never mentioned that she also supervised the soundtrack. This movie has a good soundtrack. It's all over the place, but it's good. Uh, yeah, I mean, but yeah, we got Bjork. We got <laughs> ice tea. We yeah. got Joan Jett and the black hearts. Uh, everybody. But uh, yeah, so I I obviously can't comment on the comic because I've never interacted with it or read it or whatever. But um, I I will say that, you know, 
I forgot what I was going to say. Okay. So instead, I'm just going to say you can find us at spectatorfilmpodcast.com or uh, on iTunes, Spotify, or Stitcher. And we have all our social media stuff on the website. And you can join us next week for another movie if we're all still alive next week. Max, any final thoughts? Um, all I've got to say is that get down with the sickness what? <laughs> <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha